Uh, welcome to the uh, July 1st Zach meeting. Um, I am Naomi Zauderer, the chair of um, the VAC committee. Uh, and um, a member of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. So the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee consists of nine members who advise the Campaign Finance Board and its nonpartisan voter engagement initiative, NYC Votes. In addition to hosting public hearings like tonight, this committee of voting advocates recommends legislative and administrative changes to improve New York City elections. My fellow members of the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee include Danielle Gerard, Joan Gibbs, Christopher Malone, Adiri Onyadam, and Lazida Akhtar Uden. This is Dr. Malone's first meeting as a member of the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee following his appointment earlier this year. So on behalf of the committee, I'd like to welcome you aboard. Uh, in addition, the Executive Director of the New York City Board of Elections, Michael Ryan, and Public Advocate Jumani Williams serve as ex officio members of this committee. I'd like to thank everyone in attendance this evening, and especially those who prepared testimony regarding their experience voting or attempting to vote by mail and in person in the election held last month. We've seen an extraordinary level of interest in this hearing. We've been monitoring the reports of missing absentee ballots and difficulties at various poll sites, and we look forward to hearing many more of your stories here tonight. On behalf of the committee, we are all interested in ensuring our elections provide the opportunity for every voter in New York City to have their voice heard. Coronavirus presented new and different challenges to overcome, including how we administer elections and cast our ballots. Though I believe in our ability to meet the moment and do what it takes to make sure votes are properly cast and counted. Hearing your stories tonight is especially important in this moment as we prepare for another election at an even larger scale in four months. So with that said, we will be getting started momentarily, but first I would like to turn to Amy Lowcrest, Executive Director of the New York City Campaign Finance Board for a brief report. Amy. Sorry, I was muted. Always a technical problem. Um, <laughs> thank you, Naomi, and thank you to everyone in attendance. And I'll, I second your welcome to Dr. Malone for joining uh, at his first meeting of our uh, Voter Assistance Advisory Committee. I'm Amy Lopress, the Executive Director of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. I will be brief, but I did want to acknowledge that it's moments like these that show how important it is that we get elections right and ensure that the people of New York have a voice in selecting the leaders of our city, our state, and our country. That is what democracy is all about, and that is what we are all here assembled to preserve. Despite the circumstance, the CFE was able to successfully administer the public funds program in the Queensborough president race, with over $4 million in public funds paid to every candidate on the ballot. New York City's public fund program allows candidates to raise small dollar contributions and to get their message out to voters. Though, as we know, the primary did not go smoothly for everyone. Many voters had reported difficulties in receiving absentee ballots and voting in person. There's no denying that the Board of Elections has a hard, hard job at a difficult time and various legal challenges and confusion over the content of the ballot did not make these conditions any easier to navigate. We are here tonight to surface any issues that voters of New York City have identified and lay the foundation for discussing straightforward, nonpartisan solutions as we prepare for the general election this November. We'll hear from members of the public as well as community leaders who are tracking these issues, both in recent election and historically. So again, thank you for being here tonight, and I look forward to hearing and reading the testimony provided. Next, we will hear from campaign, the Campaign Finance Board's Assistant Executive Director for Public Affairs, Eric Friedman, who is going to cover the format and logistics for the testimony portion of this hearing. Uh, sorry, thank you, Amy. I just wanna make sure before I start, I wanna give members of the committee a chance to, uh, to, to weigh in and, and, and welcome folks if they'd like. Sure, um, I will start. Hi, good evening um, to all of the committee members and also to the citizens of New York City who are watching. 
the residents of New York City. Um, my name is Jamela Rose, and I'm the Deputy Public Advocate for Civics and Community Empowerment at the Office of the New York City Public Advocate that also holds an ex officio seat on this committee. Um, first, I wanted to start by saying our heartfelt condolences to any of the individuals um, who are listening in who may have lost loved ones to COVID-19 and during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, we are definitely living in unprecedented times and our office has been made aware of many of the challenges that our New Yorkers have faced as they have gone to the ballots, um, to the, sorry, not to the ballots, to the polls um, this time around. And um, we just want you to know that even as a member of this committee and also as the Office of the Public Advocate, we are working with and liaising with Board of Elections and many of the other entities as well as advocates to ensure that November um, would be better than this previous primary. Um, we understand that voting is important democracy is important and we just have to ensure that even as we anticipate some additional challenges and we make our way through recovery in COVID, that we're ensuring that everyone is able to cast their vote and do it safely. Thank you and I'll just hand it over to whomever is next. I'll go next. Good evening. I'm Christopher Malone. I am just thrilled and honored to be part of this committee and I want to thank everyone my committee members and especially Mayor de Blasio for appointing me. Uh, I am the founding dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at Malloy College, which is just over the Queens border in Long Island. I'm a political scientist by training. I've written about race in American history and voting rights, and it is just a, a real honor for me to be part of this. And I look forward to hearing from the residents of New York City about uh, some of the issues that they faced both in the near term as well as uh, long term problems that we need to solve uh, on this committee. So thanks again. If there are other members of the committee who'd like to, to speak otherwise I can kind of lay the groundwork for for the hearing tonight. I will take silence as a sent to go ahead. So I just have a, um, so again, my name is Eric Friedman. I'm Assistant Executive Director for Public Affairs at the New York City Campaign Finance Board. Uh, I'm very excited uh, to be part of this first remote Zoom hearing of the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee. As a reminder for folks uh, who are participating, we're also broadcasting on Facebook Live tonight. Um, we are going to start, uh, Tonight's hearing with a brief staff presentation, uh, which will talk about some of the citywide numbers and statistics around this year's primary election uh, before moving into public testimony and hearing some stories from, from voters um, from the June primary. But first, uh, I want to say a few words about the work of the Public Affairs Division here at CFB uh, in the weeks and months leading up to the election. Um, I, we, all, we all know this has been a uniquely challenging year. Um, it's really just transformed New Yorkers' relationship to their democracy. Um, with a deadly pandemic that made traditional campaigning and election administration impossible, uh, and a massive wave of civic engagement in the streets that, that focused New Yorkers on the public challenges of systemic racism and policing in a way that hasn't been done in a generation. Um, with information changing daily, if not hourly, our mission of providing New Yorkers with the information they need to vote safely has really been front and center during these past three incredible months. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of the work that our staff did over the spring to communicate with New Yorkers about this election, uh, keeping voters up to date on shifting election dates, changing and changing deadlines, informing them what was at stake, who was running and what they stand for with our voter guide, helping New Yorkers know how to apply for an absentee ballot. Hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers did this for the first time this year. Um, and fill it out timely with a broad based social media campaign and targeted outreach to youth voters. I want to thank the entire staff of our public affairs division, especially uh, Sabrina Castillo, our director of partnerships and outreach, Charlotte Levitt, our director of marketing and digital communications, Matt Sollers, our director of public relations, Ali Swatek, our director of policy and research, and, uh, and certainly Amanda Melillo, our deputy director of public affairs. They each lead great teams who made this effort go. Um, we didn't do this alone. And I want to also thank our partners in this work starting with our colleagues and collaborators at Democracy NYC, who helped provide leadership for combined effort of civic organizations, 
to organize and communicate and form and advocate. Um, it's really without precedent in recent years in the city. Um, some of our partners in that effort are here tonight as well, and we're, we'll hear from them in a little bit. I wanna thank them for their work and their contributions to the effort and, and for the stories they're gonna share with us tonight. Um, I, and, I, and I wanna echo something Amy said a little while earlier. I know we're all here to, at least in part, shine a light on the things that can improve um, about, about the way elections are run in New York City, but I also wanna acknowledge our colleagues at the Board of Elections who had an extraordinarily difficult job to do under impossible circumstances that put many of them at personal rest, risk. Um, so with that, um, with the indulgence of the committee, we have our, our staff presentations to start off the hearing and help frame the discussion that's gonna follow. Um, this is gonna be an opportunity for all of us to look at the conditions that led up to the primary and identify the most important issues that really need to be addressed between now and November. Um, lest we forget the general election is four months away um, and while we have a lot to talk about, as we look back at the June primary, we also have a lot of work ahead of us. Um, so with that, I'm going to look to my colleague, Ali Swatek, to give us a look at voter registration during the first half of this year. And Amanda Mlola will follow her with a discussion of how the voting went. Hi folks, uh, my name is Ali Swadek. I'm the Director of Policy um, and Research at the Campaign Finance Board. Um, and I'm gonna be giving a short presentation to you guys on the voter registration um, situation in New York City nationally. Um, we've heard about lower um, voter registration rates. And so we decided to take a deep dive into um, the rates in New York City, just to get a sense of what we were looking at here. So. Um, <clears throat> I just want to start off with a really just basic summary of voter registration in New York City. 87.1% um, of New Yorkers are registered to vote as of June 2020. So um, that sounds really high, um, and it is, so that's great. Um, but what it means is 13% of New Yorkers are not registered to vote. And um, when we begin to look at that at an age group level, we can see that 18 to 29 year olds are actually registered at a much lower rate than other age groups. So only 62% of um, 18 to 29 year olds are registered to vote. So um, that's one of the reasons why the CFB and NYC votes focuses specifically on reaching out to young voters. Um, we have found that in presidential election years, it's most effective um, to um, gain attention to voter registration and to encourage people to register to vote. So um, this is specifically uh, particularly true for young voters. In 2016, the last presidential election year, 510,000 um, total new voters registered and 50% of those um, of that total were 18 to 29 years old. So what that means is um, naturally 18 to 29 year old, um, 18 to 29 years old are going to um, not be registered. And so as you come into, um, as you become 18 or older, you need to register. And um, so that's where we see the largest part of new registrants. There's also a chart on this page that shows um, new voter registrations for the first five months of 2020 compared to the same time period in 2016. So as you can see, um, we're pretty much in line with the registration rate for 2016. We were even a little bit ahead. Um, and then um, it began falling off around the 10th to 12th week of uh, the year in March. And I'm sure as you all know, uh, that was around the time that COVID uh, began to become a pandemic in New York. And um, so that definitely began affecting new voter registrations here. Um, the reason why it's important to look at um, new registrations on a cumulative level is it it shows the um, the deficit even further in New York City in 2020. Um, we can see on this page that um, 70 uh, around 79,000 new voters were registered as of June 2020, and that compares to 155,000 new voters as of June 2016. So obviously a huge difference. Um, and not only are new registrations down in the city, they're down in the state as well, but we are seeing a greater deficit in 
in the city compared to the state. If you look at this um, chart on the page, the green line is showing New York State, the solid line there, and the blue line shows New York City. So you can see there's about a 60,000 um, registration difference between the two on the first week of June. Okay, so I've, I've sort of gotten towards this. Basically, why do we think voter registration has decreased? Obviously, it's COVID related. Um, I hinted towards that already. Uh, based on the fact that we saw a decrease in the 12th week of the year. Um, New York on pause was um, basically stopped non-essential work and travel. Safety precautions related to COVID-19, such as limiting gatherings. Um, and then the third piece, which is not COVID related, um, there's no universally acceptable online voter registration platform at the state or city level. And I'll go into that a little bit further. So um, those three um, pieces impacted the current registration methods in the following ways. So currently you can register to vote in person at the BOE or at a voter registration event. Um, COVID, rela COVID related safety precautions and New York on pause stopped most if not all in person voter registration events. So that was a huge component in um, decreasing that method of registration. The second piece is you can register via the My DMV website with a DMV issued state ID or driver's license. Um, in New York City specifically, more than 750,000 New Yorkers age 16 or older do not have a DMV issued state ID or driver's license, which means that they would not be able to use this system. Um, this isn't unique to the COVID time period. Um, before this time, uh, folks in New York also did not have DMV issued state IDs. So this has been a continuous problem. Um, and then the third piece, printing and mailing a paper form. So this is the best option for folks without a DMV issued ID, but it takes the most effort. And since a lot of folks are working from home, they don't have printers, um, it's harder to get out and mail something. They don't want to go to the post office to buy stamps. Um, so there's more effort involved there. And um, young people who we've spoken to have told us that they do not know how to use the mail in some instances. So. Um, it definitely also particularly affects young folks. Um, I was remiss in not also stating that the DMV website, um, younger people in New York City are less likely to have a state issued ID as well. So um, I just wanna go through what we're, what we're planning on doing or what we're currently doing at the CFB through our NYC Votes Initiative um, to combat this voter registration problem and decrease. Currently, we are, are reaching out to non-registered New Yorkers via text or phone and utilizing relational organizing tactics, tactics to talk to friends and family. We're also incorporating messaging into outreach about the MyDMV portal for New Yorkers who are not registered but have DMV issued IDs. Um, and that's just because we found that maybe folks don't, aren't aware of the MyDMV portal. Um, most registrations that are processed in New York City are, um, are done on paper. So in the last um, four years, six, six to 12 times uh, the amount of paper registrations were received versus the MyDMV portal. Um, and then the third piece that we're planning on doing potentially is actively mailing voter registration forms to suspected non-registered households. Um, that sort of overcomes the issue related to printing and um, gets, gets the paper form in people's hands. The fourth element is engaging a third party tech platform like TurboVote or Rock the Vote. Um, they basically simplify the way that folks can register. It's, it's sort of online where you put in your information and they either, uh, depending on the platform, they'll mail you the form, provide you instructions, they'll send you text message reminders. So that's also something we're looking into as a potential way of combating this problem. Um, of course, the only permanent solution to this would be activating a universally accessible online voter registration platform like the CFB's online voter registration system. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, in 2018, a city council law required the Campaign Finance Board to create an online voter registration system that would be, that would allow voters to register online and it would directly um, provide the Board of Elections with a registration. So we did that 
and the site can be activated. However, um, there is a lack of communication from the state BOE to the city BOE to give them permission to use the system. And so in order to actually use it, we are now um, in a place where we're requiring state legislative action to pass a bill um, to allow the city BOE to use the system. So um, that's the end of my presentation here. Um, if folks have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And um, yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, I just want to jump in and echo what Ali was saying before. Um, I think we at the CFB are particularly alarmed at this drop off in voter registration, just for some context for this committee. What we saw in 2016 was the surge of voter registrations before the presidential primary. Um, but the majority of voter registrations come in before the presidential election in November. So about four out of five registration forms actually came after the spring primaries. Um, so, you know, the way we look at it, if this trend continues, we're going to see just even more tremendous drop off as we move into the fall at a time when more and more people are going to want to engage for that presidential election. Um, so the numbers that we see now are, I think, are just the beginning of what we could see without really dramatic change to open up the process. Um, one more thing I just want to add. Um, we saw in 2016 that there are, that there were major spikes before the voter registration deadlines. Um, our voter registration deadline was at the end of May and there was no um, corresponding spike in voter registrations during that time period. That just indicates, I think, um, Amanda's point where we have large events that are specific to um, important dates like the National Voter Registration Day, um, where we may not actually see a spike in registration if folks are not able to go to events or they don't have easy access to paper forms. I see, I see Danielle had a, had a question to ask. Uh, yes, please. That was a great presentation. Um, when we are planning to send voter registration forms to what we think are unregistered households, uh, first of all, are we really going to be able to do that? Because it sounds like a great solution. And two, would there be any way to mail more than one to each household, uh, assuming that uh, there's more than one person over 18 who's read, who could be uh, registered to vote. Yeah, Danielle, I think you hit the nail on the head for the logistical difficulties of doing that, which is one of the reasons why we're looking into it right now um, and kind of figuring out how best to do that. We, um, we do currently text and call folks who we believe to be not registered. There's a database system that we have access to that allows us to do that. So through the same method that we text and, um, and call folks, we would get their addresses and send them registration forms. I think it's a good point to potentially include two or even more. Um, another element is including registration forms in another language. So we're looking into all of that. Yeah, and I'd, I'd also like to add, um, because Ali mentioned we have access to a database, but we know that the available data is imperfect and it leaves out um, groups of voters more so than others. And that includes young voters and naturalized citizens and voters of color. Um, so Ali had briefly mentioned that we are going to be implementing a technique known as relational organizing over the summer and moving into the fall. And this is really a way to train individuals to be activators of their own networks um, so that they can identify a list of people that they know among their friends, family, coworkers, who might not be registered to vote, who might not know anything about voting, might need some persuasion to get to the polls. And this has been found to be not only a more effective method for mobilizing people, but it's also been found to reach the people that are left off of traditional lists um, and the people more likely to be underrepresented. Um, so that's why we're sort of pairing these techniques together. Um, I'm seeing in the Q&A that folks are asking about whether the bill has been introduced in the state legislature already. There is a bill introduced in the state, it just hasn't been passed yet. Just to clarify, I, I don't remember if I said that. <laughs> Ali, there's also a question about the name of that bill that needs to be passed. I think someone who's looking to help advocate. 
we will find and put the bill number into the chat yeah. that will help everyone because I don't think there's like a nice shiny name for it like there is for some legislation. No, we don't have a fancy acronym, unfortunately. Um, what this legislation would specifically do and just just for people's background um, in last year, which feels like a million years ago, but it was 2019. Uh, the state legislature did pass a bill requiring the state board of elections to build an online platform that anyone in the state could use. However, the state video, we had a two year implementation timeline. So at the earliest, it wouldn't be ready until 2021. When everyone wants to read, well, you had mentioned platform under local legislation that changed the city charter requiring us to do it. Um, and we were working with some members of the state legislature to uh, move forward a bill that would make really explicit within election law that our platform is acceptable and allowed um, because there was just some, some disagreement on both sides of the Board of Elections about whether or not that was the case. Um, and they had basically indicated they needed it clarified in election law to be able to accept our forms. Um, so this, the bill that we're discussing right now would allow us to use our online platform until 90 days after the state platform goes live, whenever that is. Um, technically, the implementation date is sometime in 2021, although there's been some uh, indication that they don't have the funds or resources to complete it on that timeline. Um, so we see some particular urgency around this to helping people in New York City get registered to vote. Hi, Amanda. I know we've spoken about this before, um, and I just need you to refresh my memory. So if we were to get this universal online voting registration system up and running, um, when is the latest that we could do that before it's like null and void for the, 20, for the 2020 presidential primary? Sure, and that's a great question. Um, off the top of my head, the voter registration deadline is October 9th. Uh, for people's reference, uh, National Voter Registration Day is September 22nd. I would say you want to get it implemented probably before the end of Labor Day or like get legislation passed before the end of Labor Day. Um, just to give you at least a few weeks before the registration deadline to be able to collect those registrations. What we saw is certainly in the 2016 presidential election and many elections since then, as Ali mentioned, you tend to see these big spikes by the deadline. Um, human beings respond to deadlines and tend to wait until the last minute. We've all been guilty of that. Um, so that's, you know, people usually wait until they have some sort of prompt, such as National Voter Registration Day when everyone's registering, or with these reminders that the deadline's coming up. So from a personal perspective and just what we've seen in the past, I think we'd want at a minimum a few weeks of cushion time to be able to accept those registrations. Thank you. Oh, wait, one more question. I'm so sorry. Um, if we were to have that implemented by September, um, do you anticipate that the Board of Elections would have difficulty processing the uptick or the volume of online voter registrations that may come through that portal? Or, or does the portal actually make it easier for them to process those applications? For them right now, it would be like a net neutral um, because the way the platform works, it's online for users, but the Board of Elections would still receive a paper form, which means that the processing on their end would look exactly the same as almost every other form they process. Um, it's an interesting question in terms of volume. Uh, just for, for context, they processed 503,000 voter registrations in 2016. Uh, I think it was something like um, at least 114,000 of those came in that last week of the voter registration deadline. So from our perspective, they're used to processing like a high volume of registrations anyway. What we think this would really be doing is shifting more people to use that online platform. Um, you know, we have built a number of things into the system to ensure the data coming in is cleaner. Um, for anyone who's ever like registered people to vote in the field on a voter registration form, I mean, people forget their address, their zip code, like what borough they live in. Um, we have a number of things to make it easier on their end to actually like locate voters and make sure that data is 
uh, is good when it gets to them. They did indicate um, in the run up to the decision to not accept the forms that if they had to accept the forms, they would be interested in electronic data transfer. And I think that's really the gold standard. Um, it's what the DMV is doing right now, um, where they are basically uh, sending registrations and electronic signatures to the DMV on a secure server that the Board of Elections pulls down daily so that they don't need to have workers basically like hand entering data from a form into a system when they could be pulling in the information directly. Um, you know, that's especially a concern, I think, at a time when, and we'll get to this in my presentation, when the number of absentee ballot requests just skyrocketed in this election and is certainly something we'd expect to see continue into the fall. Um, one other thing I just wanna to add to that, cause I'm seeing that someone is asking the question of if this city um, is able to handle online registration securely, I think that sort of goes in line with what um, Amanda was just discussing, having the form um, be processed on paper is actually, even if it does sound paradoxical, it's a much more secure way of um, transmitting information, um, unfortunately, during this time period <laughs> that we live in. Um, the, uh, but one of the other pieces is that the, the CFB worked for, for a year, I think a little more than a year, on creating this system, and um, part of it was with security in mind, so. Absolutely. And then Amanda, I promise this is my last question for you. I see Mazeda is on the call, but she, <laughs> she, she, I know she wants me to ask this. Um, so if, the, if this online voter registration portal is accepted by the state legislature and does come online, will it also um, take, accept um, registrants in other languages or, or yeah. no? It will. Um, so as the CFB, you know, we provide voter education and information we are subject to the requirements of the Voting Rights Act for providing that information in additional languages. So just like we translate the voter guide into Spanish, Chinese, Korean, and Bengali, our system would have those same languages. Um, back in 2016, we had worked with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs uh, to translate the registration form into 11 additional languages beyond those required under the VRA. Um, you know, our, our hope was that had we had that system standing, phase two would always, we had always planned to include a phase of development to incorporate those languages in as well, so we can make the forum available to as many people as possible. Um, you know, this is actually, I would say, a weakness of the state DMV system. Um, Ali and I have been working on like a voting system assessment in New York. Um, and one of the things we saw when we were looking at the DMV's online re registration platform is that it's in English only. Um, so this is a problem, especially in New York City, where we speak a lot of different languages here. Um, and that's something that's really been top of mind for us, in addition to really focusing on accessibility in general. Uh, with that, Amanda, do you want to jump off into your presentation. Absolutely. Um, I worked on screen sharing earlier, so I hope this is going to go smoothly. <laughs> can see Allie's laughing because she was one of the guinea pigs. Um, all right. So let's talk a little bit about how voter turnout looks in the primary election. Um, and I, I want to give people some context so we get a sense of scale. And I also want to talk about some of the common trends that we saw at the polls on election day or with absentee ballots which I'm, I know we have a lot of members of the public waiting to testify about their experiences as well. Um, so just to give you a sense of sort of like the upper range of what we're usually talking about in terms of turnout for the for primary election. Um, the last the last election uh, with a high high I put that in your quotes high turnout. Uh, when we were looking back just in recent years was really the March 2016 presidential primary election where you had 35% of voters turning out to vote. Um, there was a competitive primary on the Democratic side, but primaries on both the Democratic and Republican side. Um, and then you had 1.12 uh, million people turning out to vote. Um, then, you know, the next largest primary election uh, was that September 2018 state and local primary where we had 24% voter turnout. 
uh, and almost 942,000 people turning out to vote, which was just this tremendous spike in turnout from what we would usually see in a midterm election year, um, which has just been really part of this trend of increased engagement, increased turnout. Um, so we were sort of looking at these numbers for like, what's, what's the upper limit of what we might be expecting for turnout in this election? Um, so the interesting news, I think, for 2020 is we had 3.3 million people eligible to vote. Uh, we did have a Democratic presidential primary. We had a number of congressional and state primaries as well, including a couple um, on the Republican side in Staten Island um, and in other parts of the city, and a, I think a conservative party and a Save America movement uh, primary. So we just saw this tremendous influx of absentee ballot requests. Um, over 767,000 people put in requests to get an absentee ballot. Um, and then 489,000 people, just under 490,000 people, voted in person on election day. Um, which, you know, we can talk a little bit about the, the problems and, and what we don't yet know. But it's possible we could see higher turnout in this primary than we have in any primaries in recent years, um, which is not only something that's really tremendous in my mind, thinking about New York City having its first pandemic election when we were the epicenter of the virus, but it really does track with what we're seeing in other places with higher turnout, um, with the ability of more people to vote by mail. Just for some context, uh, as many of the people on this call know New York is not a traditional vote by mail state. Very few people in New York City ever cast ballots by mail because you generally need a valid excuse in order to request that ballot. Um, so, you know, in a normal election, we'd see maybe as many as 4% of voters getting an absentee ballot, such as in the 2016 November uh, presidential election. Um, but when we were looking at sort of a comparison election for the presidential primary in 2016, only 23,000 people requested absentee ballots. This time around with 767,000, that's like 33 times more uh, the number of people that you would generally see asking to vote by mail. Um, so this really represented just a tremendous scaling up on a relatively short timeline um, and a a huge shift just in how New Yorkers generally participate. Um, you know, and just, just another comment. So this is the second election during which we had early voting available. Uh, we implemented it for the first time in the 2019 general election. Um, you know, for the first time out, uh, actually I thought usage was pretty good considering this was new for people um, in an election, people wouldn't generally vote in any way. Um, you know, I think this is sort of neutral news, but I would say that early voting rates stayed relatively flat in this election. Um, as many folks on this webinar know, um, the, the, our message to people generally was if you want to vote safely, get an absentee ballot. Um, but if you want to vote in person, it's better to vote early to allow for social distancing, more space from other people at the polls. So, you know, we, we were trying to shift at some point to encourage people to vote early rather than on election day. But I think the headline news that we are seeing on election day was just that a number of people didn't receive their absentee ballots on time. Um, this was what we were seeing over and over again throughout the day. Um, those were the questions that we were fielding in our inbox uh, and on social media. And, you know, some people were out of the city and didn't really have a remedy if they didn't receive their ballot, but we know a number of people went to go vote in person because that ballot never arrived. When they went to go vote in person, I would say the second biggest problem that we saw was that for a good part of the day, voters were only receiving one out of two of the ballots they were supposed to get. Um, so this year, the presidential primary was on a ballot that was different from that state and local primary ballot. Um, poll workers didn't know that they were supposed to give voters different ballots, um, which really pointed to a lack of poll worker training and a breakdown in communication between the Board of Elections itself and the poll site coordinators who could have been giving this information to poll workers. We saw a number of poll site issues and some of them feel a little pandemic related. Some of them are run of the mill issues that we see in every election cycle. So we know that some sites open late, um, you know, poll sites are supposed to open at 6am, the poll workers are supposed to get there at 5, 
major issue is the subway is now shut down from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. So some people did have difficulty getting to their poll site so that could open on time. Uh, we heard a number of voters who couldn't be found in the electronic poll books. It sounded a little bit like tech failure where it was telling everyone in the poll site that they weren't uh, eligible to vote at that poll site. You know, we heard reports of ballot scanners being down throughout the day. Um, in some cases, it sounded like poll workers weren't following the correct emergency procedures to collect ballots when the scanners were down and they were just telling people not to vote um, or to come back later. We did see a number of long lines throughout the day due to social distancing, including more time to sort of get through poll sites in the process of signing in, getting your ballot, actually filling it out um, and scanning it and walking out. Finally, we saw a, a good deal of confusion about whether there was a process to vote, drop your absentee ballot off at a poll site. Um, voters were in fact allowed to drop their ballots off at either an early voting location or an election day poll site, but it seems like that was sort of unevenly communicated and enforced around the city. Um, we know some poll sites had processes where people could show up and actually hand those over to someone, someone who's working at the site. Um, and in other places, poll site coordinators were telling voters that they weren't able to do that. Um, so we know in other vote by mail states that a number of places allow drop off at poll sites. This was something that could have been planned for and it felt a little bit invented on the fly at times. We have some recommendations for how to move forward on these things. Some things that can be fixed on the legislative side, some things that really need an administrative fix. First off, um, most people are probably aware of this, but the ability to use temporary illness due to COVID as an excuse to get a ballot, uh, an absentee ballot in June, does not currently extend to November. Um, and we need a legislative fix to allow people to vote by absentee in the fall. Uh, for folks who don't know, Governor Cuomo um, allowed this under executive order due to his emergency powers under the pandemic. Those emergency powers currently only extend for the duration of time there is an emergency. And right now that doesn't go all the way to November. Um, so if we need to get this system in place and give the Board of Elections time to prepare, we need legislation to actually change uh, election law to allow for this. One of the things that we heard a lot on election day, voters were like, why can't I find somewhere where my ballot is in the process? There was a good deal of confusion about, you know, was my request actually received? Was it sent out? Is it in the mail? When should I expect it? Um, and the Board of Elections response was like, send us a direct message on social media. We'll look it up for you. Um, at a certain point, that solution isn't really scalable. Um, there were too many people on election day asking these questions to field them all. Um, and we know that there are tools that allow um, for a relatively low cost, the Board of Elections could pick up and use a tracking system using intelligent mail barcodes and give voters an opportunity to log into a portal and see where their ballot is in the process. We also recommend systematizing that in-person ballot drop-off at early voting locations and election day locations. Um, we know that some folks live in parts of the city where the mail can be a little bit uh, uneven or maybe they don't trust that the post office is going to get their ballot in on time um, to minimize the number of people who are like standing in line waiting for ballots waiting for scanners um, you know we could be shifting more people to vote by a mail ballot that they would then drop off in person to have that security that it's received uh, finally we would really recommend improving the counting procedures and shortening the timeline to open ballots um, some people may know that the Board of Elections wasn't even going to open absentee ballots until today um, and wouldn't start counting those ballots so that's going to delay results in races uh, for a while and we would really improve looking uh, we would really recommend looking at ways to streamline that process for in-person voting you know, I've mentioned this, we expect a, a much bigger share of people to be voting uh, in November. So if we had even 35% turnout of eligible voters in this election, we usually see around 60% in a presidential election um, where you have more than 2 million people trying to cast ballots. And we think that the safest way to do this is clearly to get as many people to vote absentee as possible. But for the people who do want to vote in person, we think it's worthwhile to shift as many people 
from being election day voters to early voters as possible. Um, so one way to do this is to increase that number of early voting locations. Uh, the Board of Elections did increase the number of locations from what they had in November last year to what they had this year. I think they added 18 or 19 sites. Um, we think it's also possible to analyze election results and see where are people more likely to vote in person. Um, where were people less likely to vote, uh, to request or vote via absentee ballot? Um, because based on analysis we've done on early voting data that's available, people are more likely to go vote early if the polling place is within a five to 10 minute walk of their apartment. Um, right now we don't have vote centers where you could go vote anywhere. So you really need a convenient location for people to wanna vote early. Um, so we could be looking at ways to make sure we're getting early voting locations in those places where more people vote early than absentee. And with that, I'm happy to turn it over to the committee to ask questions and hopefully I can answer uh, whatever you have. Amanda, there are some questions in the um, Q&A about, um, and this is echoed on Facebook as well, will we eventually be able to know how many of the voters who requested absentee ballots um, didn't receive them or ended up voting in person instead? So theoretically, yes. Um, Ali has actually already filed a request to get the list of people who uh, requested an absentee ballot. We can then compare that to the voter file to see who actually voted via absentee versus voted in person. What that wouldn't be able to tell us is how many people didn't receive ballots versus how many people received a ballot and chose to vote in person anyway. Um, you know, I know one of my neighbors who requested an absentee ballot still wanted to go vote early because she was like, I have free time during the day and our location is right there. So we know some portion of people that certainly happened to. Um, and we wouldn't be able to fully determine like who falls into what category, but we could get a ballpark estimate of how many people just didn't choose to vote absentee, even though they wanted to get an absentee ballot. Yeah, Becca, I like the way you're thinking. Um, <laughs> this is my favorite question uh, right now. <laughs> um, one of the things I think that makes it a little challenging is um, we don't know uh, if folks chose, chose to vote of their own accord um, and did receive an absentee ballot. And I think another piece that we're looking to answer is um, figuring out how many folks received their absentee ballots after the deadline for them to mail them. Um, that, that anecdotally has been something we've heard. So um, part of why the VAC meeting is so important is for people to raise up stories like that so that we understand um, how, how many people were impacted by that problem. I see Danielle has, a, has her hand raised. Shouldn't, shouldn't come as a huge surprise. Uh, when you talked about the 2 million voters, is that 60% of registered voters? Or, I'm sorry. Or, I'm sorry. <laughs> are, are you having like a fireworks situation, Danielle? <laughs> or, you know, everyone's been home for way too long. Um, <laughs> So what I was going to ask was, is the 2 million figure, is that 60% of registered voters or is that 60% of eligible voters? So we usually look at it in one of two ways. Um, here we're talking about registered voters and we're really looking at 2016 as a comparison. Um, one of the things that's really challenging is we know how many people voted in 2016 out of how many registered, out of how many who were eligible and maybe unregistered. Um, we have no idea what's going to happen this year. We came into 2020 just having looked at the trends of the previous elections, thinking we were going to see a huge spike in voter turnout. Um, you know, in the midterm election in 2018, voter turnout was up 17 points over where it was in 2014. So we're, we came into this year predicting that you could have 70% turnout among registered voters, if not more, because you know, we're seeing a lot more engagement and activism. Um, it's harder to gauge with the pandemic because we started to worry about, are we gonna have to retain people that we wouldn't normally have to retain? Does this become a retention election year instead of that like activating or engagement election year? 
Um, I think what's interesting, just seeing how many people requested absentee ballots and then ultimately voted in person, maybe that, is, maybe that actually isn't the case. Um, maybe people are motivated enough to turn out and I think we're just waiting on some data so we can analyze it and get better figures. But over 2 million people did cast a ballot um, in the 2016 November election. And that's always been our concern um, pretty much the whole time is making sure that uh, when we're, we're trying some things out in the June primary, we're keeping an eye on the election down the road that's gonna be much bigger in scale. And, and I just want to say um, that your the presentation slide of recommendations to move forward was really comprehensive and uh, I think hit the nail on the head, particularly moving up the date where we can start counting absentee ballots. And of course, that means hiring more people and also securing the space mm -hmm. to set up as many machines as possible to do so after the envelopes have been reviewed to make sure that uh, they are valid ballots. I also see a question from Facebook in the Zoom webinar chat pertaining to absentee ballots um, because the State Board of Elections at sort of the last minute came up with like a, a, a solution for voters with disabilities who need to use screen readers and other devices in order to fill out an absentee ballot. Um, so the solution they came up with was allowing people to um, fill it out using their screen reader or, or accessible device and then they would have to print it out and send it in so that they could vote privately from home just like any other voter. Um, the issue, uh, there are a number of issues with that. I mean, one, if we're talking about how a ton of people don't have printers, I personally don't have a printer, um, asking people to rely on printers uh, I think shuts people out of the process um, at a time when more and more things are electronic and the need for a printer is less and less. Um, we also heard that system is glitchy and we, we do anticipate testimony from someone today just about how that process worked out. Um, so we are, we are in support of making that process better um, and of making um, those that that accessibility look more in line with what people with military and overseas ballots have um, and we're looking into best practices in other states that have found better ways to, to address this. So I see uh, one raised hand, uh, Okui, from, uh, has, a, has a question. Thank you. Um, are, are we seeing any, um, any kind of uniformity in the trends across uh, geographically? Like, is there any difference in like which parts of the city are, are they're more affected by declines in voter registration or in turnout at all? So we are starting to look into at least the voter registration piece, because that's one thing we can take a look at. Um, we just need some time to sort of map it out. Uh, the absentee ballot data, like we have to wait a little bit to obtain a voter file from the Board of Elections, but one of our first uh, points of action would be to start to map that. Um, like I have, I have hypotheses about what absentee voting looks like around the city, but we can't really know until we see it. Um, you know, we're seeing some anecdotal stuff or some stuff even at the borough level. For example, Staten Island had a much lower uh, absentee request rate than some of the other boroughs. Um, and, and that tracks with some of the trends we're seeing nationally. Um, so those are the things we're going to take a look at. Um, you know, I think absentee voting could very well be tied to, you know, I'm sure a lot of people have seen the stories about like who left the city and what are areas of the city where people didn't leave. I wouldn't be surprised if absentee voting were tied to that in some way. Um, and we just were holding on until we get a voter file and we can start to analyze that. Um, I, see, yeah. I see one raised hand, uh, one more raised hand, Dion Powell, if you have a question. Hello? Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, here's my question. I'm a candidate, but the problem is this, that they're having at the Board of Elections, but most of these pre-stamped envelopes aren't going to be time-stamped. So if somebody votes after the deadline, then it can still be accepted, even though it's not time-stamped the day of, you know what I mean? It might be a late vote, but it shouldn't count, and some should count, but these envelopes that they're mailing in to vote aren't time-stamped to tell what's eligible after the seven-day deadline. You understand what I'm saying? 
I think so. And let me explain what I understand the problem to be. And you can tell me if we're talking about the same thing. Um, so one of the things that we heard in advance of election day was, um, you know, the, the Board of Elections sent uh, the absentee ballots to voters with those prepaid uh, postage marks in on the envelope. Um, we, we heard from a number of, po we heard that some post offices don't issue cancellation marks on those prepaid mass mailing postage uh, right. envelopes, which is a huge problem um, because now you have up until election day to get your ballot postmarked. Um, and if it's not postmarked and they receive it even one day after the election, they won't count it. Um, and that's something that's totally out of the control of voters. If they dropped it in the mailbox or took it to the post office thinking it was going to get a cancellation mark on it. And then just for whatever reason, the post office didn't do that. Um, we do know the Board of Elections was working with post offices on this. And it's something I think we will all continue to work on um, for, for November. Another thing to consider is that states that have vote by mail do allow some sort of grace period um, where they would still accept and count something without a cancellation mark, understanding that's out of the hands of the voter. Um, so for example, right now, like the rule for everybody is your ballot must be postmarked by election day. So it had to be Bye. by June 23rd. It has to be at the Board of Elections within seven days of the election. Right. Um, in vote by mail states like California, they'll allow this grace period of up to three days after the election for a ballot without a postmark to come in and be counted. Um, because right now the Board of Elections practice would be, even if they get it the day after the election, so of course it had to be put in the mail the day before, they just are saying they don't know when it was postmarked and it can't be counted. Right. So yes, I, I think that's something we should be recommending as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Do you have any other questions uh, for Amanda to follow up her presentation? I know we have people waiting to uh, share their stories. Um, we will be continuing to monitor the, the Q&A and chat um, throughout the hearing. If folks have open questions, uh, please post them there and we'll try to get to them as we move through. Um, I'll give people one more chance before moving on. I do see a number of questions in the Q&A, so I will be typing answers to everybody. Yeah, Amanda and I will be answering your yes. Q&A questions live. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing. All right. Um, so with that, I, I think we're really, uh, we're going to move ahead into, into public testimony. And uh, again, since this is our, um, you know, it's our first remote hearing, and, and we're very excited to bring the hearing to this format. And so... I want to lay out, lay out a few kind of ground rules and, and let folks know what to expect. Um, so first, I just want to say we have 66 voters who've already provided us with written testimony. Um, so each of these are, are going to be posted on our website in the coming days, uh, along with a video from, from this hearing and, and a written transcript once that's prepared. Um, I will post uh, as we start, excuse me, an updated list of members of the public who've signed up to testify. We've had some folks have already kind of stepped in uh, into the chat and Q&A to, to, to put their names on the list. So we will update. Um, again, you can, you can kind of see the chat with that little button at the bottom of your screen. Um, I, will, I will call on people through that list in order. And so for folks who have joined the, 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 this hearing as attendees, um, wait a few seconds after I call on you. You will see a little message on your screen that says you've been promoted to be a panelist and you'll be able to turn on your camera and your microphone to speak. Uh, so those controls, if, 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 if you, you know, if you'll see those controls at the bottom of your Zoom window as well. Um, so again, we have a lot of people who, who we're really thankful have come forward to tell their voting stories this evening. Uh, we're gonna do our best to hear everyone out. Uh, so in order to give everyone a chance to be heard, we're gonna, we're gonna try and limit the testimony to two minutes each. Um, Jordan Pantalone, our intergovernmental liaison, he's gonna be our timekeeper. Uh, I'm gonna keep his video at the top of your screen so he can give you a wave when you have about 30 seconds left. Um, and again, just in the interest of, of giving everybody a chance, we will, um, we will close off the mic after two minutes so that we can move through the list. So uh, once again, um, please, please feel free to make comments or questions uh, in the Q&A or chat. 
and, and uh, Amanda and Ali, as they know, it'll be answering questions there. Um, if you don't see your name on the list and would like to testify, please, um, please um, put your name in in the chat uh, as well, and we will and we will get to you. Um, so with that, um, I will um, we will uh, I will call on our first first speaker from uh, if I see her is Nicole. Uh, Miglior from Democracy NYC. Is she, is she here? I'm not sure if you can see me. There you are. Okay. <laughs> so please, uh, you're, you're, you please begin. Thank you. Great. So good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Nicole Miglior. I'm the policy advisor for Democracy NYC. And for those who aren't familiar with us, um, we are a mayoral initiative that started in 2018 tasked with making elections fairer and more accessible for all New Yorkers. Um, my team and I are on this back meeting tonight mostly to hear from others, but we did want to share just a little bit about what we did for this primary election and things that we did observe, um, echoing many of the sentiments that the CFB has already shared. Um, so first, we were very fortunate. We were able to partner across the city with other agencies, um, Civic Engagement Commission, Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, the, the Mayor's Public Engagement Unit, and NYC Votes. And together, uh, we did a lot of outreach to New Yorkers. We held three texting days of action where we sent out more than 200,000 texts to youth 18 to 20, 19 years old citywide. We placed advertisements in 10 plus languages on Hulu, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Link NYC kiosks. Um, we sent a Department of Education letter to school families citywide. We used Notify NYC to text folks about how to request an absentee ballot. And then lastly, we produced two public service announcement videos on how to apply and then fill out your absentee ballot. Um, and throughout, the city's messaging was pretty consistent. It was first request your mail-in ballot and then to return it by the deadline and for folks that preferred to vote in person, encouraging them to vote early. Um, of course, um, there were you know, positives and negatives for this election. Early voting went very smoothly. Um, in part, it could be due to low turnout, um, but we did see actually higher early voting use in New York City than outside of New York City, which was encouraging. Um, and then of the in-person turnout that we saw total um, about a little less than 10% were early votes. So as was mentioned earlier, November was the first time that we had early voting. And our hope is that as it becomes more regular part of our elections, that it will you know, become part of the normal course that folks choose to vote early. Um, but there were things that didn't go so great. Um, absentee voting, I think, is top of mind for all of us. Um, there were widespread reports of voters not receiving their absentee ballots across New York City. Uh, I personally never received mine, but my partner received his. Um, many stories like this of inconsistent um, absentee ballots. Um, and for folks that were out of state or for those with disabilities or for those with health concerns that couldn't actually go vote in person, um, you know, this is definitely a concern for us that we're monitoring very closely. Um, and, you know, the one thing that really sticks out as Amanda mentioned earlier, I believe, is that there is no ability to track from beginning to end, from request to actually the vote being counted, someone's absentee ballot. And this is something that we think can definitely be implemented. Um, In-person voting on election day also had some bumps. Um, you know, voters did not receive both the presidential and local ballots in the Democratic primaries. Uh, some voters were given the wrong ballots. Some um, Poll sites did not have ballots. Um, poll sites opened late due to MTA issues. Um, you know, all of these things we think um, have solutions. And we hope to see, um, you know, more poll worker training, better communications to troubleshoot to the poll workers as things happen. And then in general, just a deeper look at the Board of Elections structure um, and more transparency to the public. Um, and, you know, again, we, as a mayor's office, you know, are ready to, to work with the Board of Elections. And, you know, we hope that for November, as we expect turnout to be much higher, that we can assist in making sure that it goes as smoothly as possible. Um, and with that, again, very 
um, interested to hear what everyone has to say and I'll turn it over to the rest of the speakers. Thanks very much, Nicole. Uh, next, we have uh, Benny Poi from Malaya. Benny. Can, can everyone see me? Oh, wait, let me. All right, can everyone see me? Hello? Perfect. Yes, we can see you. All right, thank you. All right, so as, uh, as was mentioned, my name is Benny Poi, and I am currently serving as a Northeast Program Coordinator at the Naleo Educational Fund. I appreciate the opportunity to share the following testimony with you all today regarding the many issues in the June 2020 primary election. Uh, we at the Naleo Educational Fund recognize the unprecedented and severe difficulty that the COVID pandemic has imposed upon those responsible for administering and safeguarding the integrity of our elections in New York, as well as ensuring that voting is safe and accessible to all of our citizens. At the same time, we believe that there is more that, offic that officials could have done and must do in the coming months to secure the vote for New Yorkers who desire to have their voice heard in the November general election. Uh, we are likely to hear many of those issues today um, and to hear some of those issues as an organization that represents uh, Latinos in all civic spaces, including election work. Um, I myself had various issues um, in, uh, in casting my ballot when I went to drop off my absentee ballot in person, and there seems to have been a lapse in the training of poll workers because they were not aware that I could do that. Um, but with that being said, uh, we did want to provide some recommendations um, for the upcoming November election um, so that we can learn, so that we can take advantage of the lessons learned in this, in this June primary. Um, as, as Ali and Amanda both uh, quite astutely noticed, um, we witnessed the depression in voter registrations and, urge, and we urge administrators to accept online voter registration requests from any resident, regardless of whether they have a signature already on file with the DMV or any other state agency. We find this to be one of the first uh, obstacles to Latino voters. Uh, in addition, election administrators must anticipate and prepare to handle very large increases in interest in absentee voting by securing additional balloting materials and ballot processing machines. Many New Yorkers have never voted by mail and are unfamiliar with procedures that were, until this year, available only to a fraction of the electorate. Um, so the Board of Elections must intensify efforts to encourage and assist many to vote absentee in the interest of minimizing crowds at polling places to ensure that voting is safe, is safe and accessible. Latinos and other voters who are members of language minority communities uh, will have particular- Two minutes, just a heads up. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Latinos and other voters who, who are members of language minority communities will have particular need for accessible information about voting that helps them obtain voting materials in their preferred languages. Uh, during a normal election, many of these voters would prefer to vote in person where they could speak with poll workers in their preferred language and easily obtain in-language materials. Um, I won't go forward because I, I see that I'm running out of time, um, but we do hope that the lessons learned in this last election are, are um, you know, have us prepared for the November general election. Uh, thank you for the campaign finance board and your partnership. And I'm excited to hear what others have to say um, with some of the issues that they faced uh, on the June primary. Thank you. Thank you, Benny. Um, and just again, a reminder, I, I, all everyone's written materials will be available um, on our website. We'll be making sure that people have access to those um, after the hearing. Uh, next, uh, we'll hear from Monica Bartley. Hello, Monica. Hi. <laughs> I'm seeing you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Monica Bartley. I'm a community organizer at the Center for Independence of the Disabled New York. Thank you so much for this opportunity to testify. 
Absentee voting was the preferred option for many voters with disabilities who did not want to risk voting in person in the current COVID-19 environment. Our concerns that some members of the disability community would be disenfranchised unless absentee ballot was accessible or available in alternate format was addressed by litigation against the State Board of Elections brought by advocates with disabilities and a coalition of agencies, including Sydney. The accessible ballot is a fillable PDF that should allow voters with disabilities to read and mark the document with assistive technology. It was available from the BOE on request. Some people with disabilities lived alone and did not have a trusted family member to or a friend to help them as the ballot or have the technology to read the ballot or to print the ballot. The, so the accessible ballot did not work out as successfully as we had hoped. In one case, a voter was able to successfully use a computer to read and mark the electronic ballot, but was unable to print it, so had to vote in person. She was quoted in the American Prospect as saying, if you get all the way through that, and the only thing that messes you up is printing the damn thing out to be able to send it off, that's horrible. I cannot explain to you how horrible that is. Some voters did not receive their absentee ballots, although they applied for it early. Due to their medical condition, they did not want to take the risk to vote in person. So that's two minutes, were, just a heads up. Okay, they were disenfranchised due to the lack of a viable option. So I'll just move to my recommendations. We need to work on resolving these barriers to voting for the November elections. So we would like to see the, um, an improvement in the accessible ballot by selecting a standardized option that can be accessed by various screen readers. Absentee ballots should be mailed out at least three weeks before the election so people who prefer to use this option will be able to do so. And all poll workers should be trained to promote the use of the BMD as an option, whether the person has a disability or not. Thank you. Thank you so much for that testimony, Monica. Okay, you're welcome. Um, next, uh, we will call on Emmeline Paez from the Hispanic Federation. Awesome, good evening, everyone. Um, Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having us here and, and for providing this platform for us to uh, echo the concerns during this election. Um, my name is Emily Pius, and I'm the Director of Government Affairs and Civic Engagement for the Hispanic Federation. Headquartered in New York City, Hispanic Federation is a nationwide Latino membership organization founded to advance and empower the Latino community socially, politically, economically, and academically. Uh, the Federation does that by supporting and strengthening Latino nonprofits, conducting public policy, research, and advocacy. Um, the Federation's civic engagement work uh, is guided by the belief that when uh, Latinos go, uh, are informed, they go out and everyone wins. In light of the recent events, we're doubling down on our commitment to ensure that Latinos can easily and safely participate in elections. Um, in preparation for the New York State primary, held on uh, June 23rd, 2020, our team engaged 200,000 uh, registered Latino voters in New York City to get out the vote for the upcoming election. Our work focused um, on providing information to voters, which included absentee ballot deadlines, uh, how to find early voting polls, polling sites, um, and education, uh, election day reminders. Um, through these one-on-one -on -one communications, uh, Hispanic Federation gathered key feedback regarding voting experiences. Um, and I'll just go over three uh, bullets um, to keep things concise. The, the first um, was uh, voting by mail. Several community residents expressed deep concerns about their absentee ballots. Many of them did not receive absentee ballots um, on time and ultimately missed the primary election submission deadline. 
this swayed many voters away from casting their ballots, primarily when many of them had challenges uh, um, in in-person poll site due to personal or family health concerns. Early voting, many voters shared their ability uh, to ease through the lines um, and cast their ballots during an early voting day. However, many of them, just, uh, because of the distinction between their early voting poll site location from their primary poll site location, did have some confusions on, on that end, despite our, 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 our messaging as well and letting them know of the difference. Um, having one central- Two minutes, location, just a heads up. Absolutely. Um, having a central location for both early voting and election day was, is a preferred method. Voters um, are expressed uh, their dismay when they learned that early voting sites closed at an earlier time than they did on election day. Um, for election day, there were several issues at various poll sites, on, um, including long lines, broken scanners, failure to identify names despite uh, some voters working there for several, uh, voting there for several years, lack of operational systems at poll sites, um, and also Spanish translators had trouble giving clear instructions to Spanish speaking voters. Um, we thank you all in advance for taking um, our feedback and consideration for the general election. We expect and hope that for a larger turnout in November and are committed to the voter experience to be as smooth as possible. And the Hispanic Federation welcomes any working group or leading discussions on uh, improving education language and access to um, ensure that we have a high uh, voter turnout and participation. So thank you all. Thank you, Emily, for that for that testimony. Uh, it's much appreciated. Um, next, next on our list is uh, Diane Burroughs from the League of Women Voters. Diane, are you here? If you are, could you raise your hand? I right, don't see you in the in the in the in the list. Um, we will uh, move on to the next next name on the list. Um, Olga Fulakoris from Nyperg, are you here? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, how's it going? Um, I'll just get started. Um, good afternoon. My name is Olga Filikoris, and I'm the Voter Empowerment Coordinator for the New York Public Interest Research Group, also known as NYPERG. Uh, so how did New York's first effort at mail-in voting go? Uh, not so great. Uh, the, com the compressed timetable added workload for the absentee ballot requests and additional logistical training and material needs highlighted new issues, as well as big flaws in New York's election system that existed pre-pandemic. We call on the New York City Council and Mayor to hold the NYC BOE to account. We also urge the state legislator to hold hearings to see what can be done to make the system work better. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today. Uh, the single biggest complaint from voters was that they did not receive their ballots in time and thus had to go to the polling place to cast their vote. The timetable for getting the absentee application submitted was too ambitious. This created a series of issues. Um, one was absentee ballots arrived with timing that had no rhyme or reason. Queens voters Armando and Ada Moritz Shackleclin applied for their respective absentee ballots on the same day in late May. Armando received his ballot on June 22nd, but Ada had not arrived by June 23rd. And as a new mother of an infant, Ada was not keen on increasing her exposure risk, but was left with no other option but to vote in person at her poll site. Absentee ballots arriving with little or no time to spare. Way too many stories were shared with us from longtime voter, voters, voter advocacy organization staff, volunteers working on NYPERG's democracy project, and others about their absentee ballots arriving on or close to election day. Even worse, some absentee ballots arrived after election day or not at all. The BOE's response that voters should just vote in person if their absentee ballot got screwed up is unacceptable, especially for people who are or live with immunocompromised or high-risk folks or voters who are out of town and cannot reasonably travel to their poll site. The Campaign Finance Board, the City Council, and the Mayor should press the BOE to answer these questions. One, why didn't folks get their ballots? Were there disparities based on the different operations by different borough offices of the board? Two, what are the increased hardware and fiscal needs for printing and processing applications? It's two Three, minutes. What, perfect, thank you. I'll move to recommendations. Um, some, of course, are requests for an absentee ballot should be earlier. Uh, second would be allow voters to track their ballots in the same way as mail delivery purchases are tracked. Um, 
And longer term, New York should just join the states of Colorado, Hawaii, Oregon, and Utah in running all of their elections by mail. We urge the governor and legislator consider vote by mail with options for in-person poll site voting for continued for November. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thanks very much, Olga. Uh, much Thanks. appreciated. Um, so next on our list, um, the next name on our list is Julie Clam. Uh, we, uh, we don't see her in the attendee list. One, just one, one reminder for, for everyone, uh, if, uh, I'll ask, uh, if you've given us your name, if you could do us a favor and make sure that your display name in Zoom is the, is the same as the name you gave us. Um, if you hover over your name in the attendees list and click more, you have the opportunity to rename yourself, um, just so we know that you're here when we're looking for you. Um, I, will, I will move to the next name on the list, which is Teresa Kerrigan. Julie, if you are here, please raise your hand and we will circle back to you. I don't see Teresa Kerrigan on the list either, Eric. Hi there. Good evening. Hi. Here she is. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Please, please uh, proceed. Thank you to the committee um, and to the board for this opportunity to testify this evening. I appreciate the work that, the tremendous amount of work that has gone into making absentee ballots available to people. Um, I have four main points. Um, just as a private citizen who was trying to apply for an absentee ballot, um, first issue was not being able to apply successfully for an absentee ballot on the website, I tried over multiple weeks. Um, as many of these issues have been mentioned already, and I want to thank everybody for their presentations as well. Um, but that was a, an issue for me personally. Um, I continued to receive an error message despite being a registered voter at the same location for years. Um, second point: I also do not own a printer and don't know anyone who does in New York. Um, so thank you for acknowledging that as a potential roadblock for many people. Um, I did not receive my absentee ballot until the Monday, uh, the day before the elections. Um, and that was very concerning as everyone has mentioned, no way to track um, where, whether that would arrive or not. Um, and I didn't have the opportunity to go in person to vote the weekend before. Um, to vote early, although I do appreciate that it is an option for some people. Um, my, made, my fourth final and major concern was that when I ultimately handed in my absentee ballot in the envelope to my polling place, it was not clear to me that that was being registered or recognized. Um, and the, if we, there was some way we could improve the communication around the validity and process for that, that would be very much appreciated. Um, I did not know if they were supposed to scan it on arrival. It just got put in a stack by a nice girl who was standing at the table by the door. Um, but thank you very much for the opportunity again um, and for all of your work. Thank you, Teresa, for your testimony. Uh, next name on our list is Ebert Mann. Can you see me? Hi. Please go ahead. How are you doing? Hi. Okay. How you doing? Uh, thanks for just having the opportunity to speak on um, how this uh, voting cycle went. Thanks for all the committee for just giving me an opportunity to chat about it. And uh, basically, my situation was was pretty was pretty straight pretty straightforward in that uh, my wife and I we both received our application for our, for our absentee ballots on the very same day. And when we went to apply for our absentee ballot, we did it on June 10th, which was the Wednesday. And both my wife and I both went online and, and thankfully we had no problems applying for it. The website worked well, we were able to put in our application and it was accepted. The only issue was my wife got her ballot the following Friday on the 19th. And at the same time, I received an email from the um, the board, the NYC vote board, basically stating that if I didn't receive my absentee ballot by time, that I should consider planning to go in to vote. 
And even though myself, I do have an immunocompromised um, situation, I was planning to go on because knowing how my local voting site is, which is my local church in the area, I was willing to do that. But then on Saturday morning at about 10 a.m., that was when my absentee ballot came. And that was after I called the, the voter board and I chatted with a very um, receptive um, person there who basically said, explained to me that it was so many requests for, um, for absentee ballots that are being sent out in bulk mail. So that's what, why, okay, why she simply told me just to look out for it. But I did get it, we did file it, and we were able to send it back in successfully that day on Saturday. So thanks so much for just giving me an opportunity to chat about it. Thanks to all the board members. Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, it's much appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, uh, next up, we have Josh Chatton. Did I get that right, Josh? I don't know that he's here. I'm not seeing him in the... Uh, okay. I, I, know. I just uh, promoted him to a panelist, so Josh? Yeah, I'm here. Please, uh, my video on. Please proceed. Hi. Uh, first, I'd just like to thank the committee and join the chorus of voices that for all of the presentations that have been given and the time it has taken um, each member of the committee, NYC Votes, and the board in putting this hearing together. Um, my own difficulty and experience in receiving an ab absentee ballot, which I never did. Um, I actually mailed my first application in late March. Um, I received a call back and I was in Los Angeles, uh, sort of stuck there because of the COVID stay at home orders, knowing that I would probably be there through June. Uh, I received a call stating that I needed to reapply, which I did maybe a week later, um, when I still hadn't received uh, my ballot in the mail in California, I decided to call again. Um, I was told at that time that my ballot had been mailed on May 26th, that was in a batch, that had, be, that had been sent out. Uh, this was on June 2nd. So I waited about another week because I figured that the Memorial Day holiday might have, you know, extended the, the time that it took to get me my ballot in California. Unfortunately, uh, it never did come. I actually left Los Angeles on June 17th, so I was lucky enough and able to vote in person here in Astoria, Queens. Um, one thing that I did want to bring up, I spoke with a member of the Queens Board of Elections, her name is Donna, and she let me know that the New York City Council had actually contracted a third party vendor to send out the absentee ballots um, to her knowledge. And to her knowledge, this had been the first time that that had happened, that usually the Board of Elections uh, took that on internally. So I guess my, my bigger question is, um, A, is that true? Um, I've sent a few messages out to the BOE, to the New York City Council, the respective uh, committees on the council. I've yet to hear back, it's been a couple of weeks, so that's why I wanted to join tonight. So A, is that true? And B, will that- It's just a heads up. Okay. Learning to me, but I've I've never had an issue in receiving an absentee ballot. I've been on this for 20 years, so I just wanted to voice my concern tonight as a private citizen and provide my experience for um, you know everybody out there. And again, pose that question about um, the actual mailing of the ballots and the process by which it was done this year. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, I may look to, to Amanda to see if she has a, a an answer to your question. Before I let you go, I do need to give you compliments on your pen. Oh yeah, I made sure to wear this tonight. <laughs> I actually won that in one of the last elections. I you know, showed my I voted sticker on Instagram and the NYC votes crew sent me out a, a fancier pen. So I wear it when I vote. So Thank you for representing. Yeah. Can, can I ask you and actually everyone who testifies, it would be helpful if you said which borough you were in. You oh, were sure. Going. Yeah, I'm in Queens. I'm in, a, in Astoria. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're, this is not the first time I've heard that the BOE was telling people that city council contracted vendors to send okay. out absentee ballots. I'm 
confused by that. We will look into it more um, because it would be the Board of Elections that contracts vendors, although I would imagine that City Council, if they needed additional funds in order to make mm -hmm. that happen, would have given them the funds to make them whole. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it seems like you're not the only person that heard like City Council was contracting vendors for the Board of Elections. Uh, it's something we'll look into further, but it sounds it sounds a little off to me personally, and I I feel almost like that could just be misinformation someone had at the staff level and might have been giving out to people. Okay. Yeah, it sounded off to me as well. Yeah, but it's it's useful to flag and something we'll ask around about. Well, thank Josh, you. thank you, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Um, so the next few names on our list seem to not be present. Uh, if, we, if we skip over you um, and you're here, please raise your hand and we will circle back to you. Um, but but I'm, we're gonna call now on Imani Clenance. Hi, are you able to hear me? Okay, great. Sorry, please go ahead. Great. Um, my name is Imani Clenance, and some of the issues that I faced were addressed earlier in the meeting, but I'll tell you about my issues on election day, um, and I'm in Manhattan. The absentee ballot I requested didn't arrive before election day, so I went to the Board of Elections website to make sure I understood which races were being contested in my district. These were the Democratic presidential primary and the Democratic primary for the 13th Congressional District. On Tuesday morning, I went to my polling site at the Balton in Harlem. Once I was in my booth, I saw the presidential candidates and delegates, but didn't see the three co congressional candidates from the sample ballot. I went to the poll workers and said, isn't there a congressional primary today? And they didn't know what I was talking about and said, today is the primary for president. I said, I know that, but isn't there a congressional primary as well? I don't have that ballot. They told me that that election is in November and attempted to explain to me the difference between president and Congress. I'm familiar with our three branches of government and explained to them that November is the general election and before that is a primary, which is today. No one knew anything about it, up to the person overseeing this site. It was quite possible that I'd read the Board of Elections site wrong and there was no congressional primary for my district, but I wasn't gonna leave until I was sure. No one there, not even the site coordinator had answers. So they gave me the phone number for the Board of Elections so I could call and ask. And then they asked me to let them know because they were curious as well. The person I spoke to confirmed that in fact there should be two ballots and they would send a supervisor to my site. When I told the poll workers this, they started looking and eventually found another set of ballots with a different code not indicating what they were. I cast my ballot and asked what happens with the people who came in before me. They only got one ballot, I was told. I said, I'm aware of that, but what's the remedy? All I got were shrugs and the statement that at least it happened now and not at lunchtime. This is an unacceptable failing of our electoral process. It's bewildering, sad, and quite frankly scary that I should have to explain the difference between a primary and general election to poll workers. That the people running just a heads up. Okay, thank you. That the thank people you. running the election site don't know what elections they're running. And the fact that the reports of this happening across the city seems to be a, a system-wide failing. And that there were lots of people who were unknowingly denied their right to vote in full. Thank you for listening and addressing this problem. Thank you, Imani, for your advocacy at the polls. This is a story we heard a lot on election day. So thank you for, for speaking up about it. Thank you for listening. Um, next name on our list is Rachel Tiven. Uh, it looks like Mary is after Rachel. Okay, sorry. Mary uh, Kalamkarian. Okay, we'll move on to Mary Kalamkarian. And, and Rachel, if you are here again, please raise your hand and then we'll circle back to you. Yep. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, oh start video. Sorry. I'll start my video. Okay like four months and we still haven't gotten it right. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, members of the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify tonight. 
My name is Mary Collum Carrion, and I'm a registered voter residing in Election District 7, Assembly District 74, which is in Manhattan. My polling place is PS20 Anna Silver. My experience trying to vote in the New York State primary during this pandemic is a textbook case of voter disenfranchisement and potential suppression. I'm very lucky that I am a salaried worker, now work from within my election district at home, and have some degree of flexibility in my workday. If not, the BOE's negligence would have cost me my right to vote. Over the last four months, I've taken just about every precaution I can afford not to contract COVID-19. I therefore registered for an absentee ballot. When, as of Monday, June 22nd, it had not arrived, I had to make the difficult decision of whether or not to vote. I ultimately decided it was incumbent on me to vote in person with precautions. I arrived at my polling station masked at approximately 7.30 a.m. in order to vote before work. One of the workers coordinators at the sign-in greeting table was not wearing any mask at all. Once I reached my table, uh, 774, I was greeted by a poll worker who asked me for my name and my identification. Of course, I refused knowing that voter ID laws are a tool of voter suppression and not a state requirement. Eventually, the poll worker took my name down, but he then told me that my address was not in the computer system and that this must not be my polling station, also untrue. Evidently, the problem was the software or database that the poll worker was using, not me. I was then told that I could instead vote by affidavit, except that within five minutes in a pandemic in a school gymnasium, no one could locate the affidavits. After about 20 minutes inside the polling station, while trying to keep my six foot distance from all people at all times, I decided to leave. I eventually returned to the polling station at 1.30 p.m. on my lunch break, and when I arrived, the database problem was still prevailing six hours after my first visit. Shortly after That's I arrived, two minutes. thank you. Okay, thank you. Shortly after I arrived at 1:30, however, two BOE workers who were not, who did not seem to be with the polling station, arrived to replace the tablet in use for my assembly district, therefore, thereby enabling me and the other voters who were waiting to vote. But you do have to wonder how many voters from my street, my district, my part were disenfranchised during those six hours. How many votes were lost? How many voters decided not to try again? And so on. Thank you for hearing my concerns and acting on them in a way befitting of our democracy. Thank you so much, Mary, for, for sharing your story. Um, we're going to jump down the list uh, to Elizabeth Hutton. Uh, again, please, please let us know where you're from, uh, where you vote, and uh, we'll get you started. Hi, can you hear me? Can. Okay. Um, hi, uh, my name is Elizabeth Hutton. I live in Manhattan, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to share my experience tonight. I applied for my absentee ballot via email on Thursday, May 28th. I attached a PDF of my completed application and also included the requested information in the body of the email. In addition, I attached a photograph of my voter card with my voting information next to my signature and a statement the information in the application was correct. I wanted to make sure I covered all of my bases and my information was easy to locate in the system. On Thursday, June 11th, I called the Board of Elections to check on the status of my application. The woman I spoke with was very nice, but she did seem overworked. I was told that they had not received an absentee ballot application from me for this election. She offered to mail me an application, I explained that I had already mailed my completed application. Concerned about the proximity of the election, I wanted to ensure my ballot would be on its way to me as soon as possible. Since the website and the information from my state senator stated I could apply over the telephone, I asked if I might do so then. I was told that was not possible because they couldn't just mail a ballot to anyone. I then asked if I could forward her my application email. When she read my email, she assured me I had provided the correct information and that the signature requirement was waived due to COVID-19. She also very kindly assured me that she would print and hand deliver my application to the appropriate individual so it would be processed. I checked my mailbox on Sunday, June 21st. I had still not received my application. This meant that in order to exercise my civic duty to vote, in spite of the coronavirus, I would need to vote in person. There was no line when I arrived at the NYU Palladium. Despite a brief delay in locating my information, I was able to cast my ballot. Out of curiosity, I checked my mailbox on my way home. Still no ballot. 
I sent my application and followed up to check its progress well before the deadline to apply. My ballot still did not arrive in a timely way. No one should have to risk their health to vote in the middle of a pandemic. Please take this information into consideration when planning for the fall election. Thank you for letting me share my experience. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for, for sharing your story. It's much appreciated. Um, we, uh, we are going to move down the list to uh, Melissa Sands Gordon. As a reminder, please start off, tell us where, where you live and, and where you vote. Is that you, Melissa? Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah, please, please okay, go ahead. Great. Currently en route. Um, my name is Melissa Sainz-Gordon. I live in Ridgewood, Queens. I'm transparent in New York. Uh, we launched in May and our initiative reached over 12,000 people. And in the time leading up to election day, we received a flood of questions regarding the voting process. Um, we would also like to thank NYC Votes who answered our questions via Instagram in real time. It was really helpful. Um, for this hearing, we conducted a survey to document the various experiences of the recent primary. 170 people participated. In requesting an absentee ballot, 24.8% said they had to request an absentee ballot multiple times. 32.5% said they received their request. Sorry, 32.5% said they never received their request. Um, which was promised by Governor Cuomo's executive order. Of those that requested their absentee ballot, 57.8% uh, received their ballot before June 23rd, but 7.5% received on June 23rd, 102 after June 23rd, and 24.5% said their absentee ballot never came. Of the overall voting experience, for those who voted in person, 66% had no issues at all, but 66% is not a passing grade and is also unacceptable. Many of those issues, um, many of the issues voters experience echo much of what has been said today. Um, receive ballots at their full site. Voters also mentioned not receiving their absentee ballot uh, or requested at the same time. And for this one voter also thought that police presence at their pool site was intimidating and may discourage people from voting in the future. Absentee um, voting issues and concerns that were also noted. The deadline to submit was incorrectly marked on absentee ballots. We got a lot of questions about that. Official use box was also not clearly marked on an absentee ballot. So people would fill it out and then we're worried that their ballot wasn't um, going to be accepted. In conclusion, the heads up, that's seconds, two minutes. Okay. Um, Thank you. We'd like to make Okay, thanks. <laughs> Is that please please finish your please finish your thought if oh. you if you yeah. Oh okay, thanks. Um this will also be submitted via email. Um ultimately sixty seven percent of those surveyed said that it was their first time voting by mail or absentee. And when these systems don't work, it fosters distrust in the voting system and ultimately it's a form of voter suppression. Um, voting needs to be easy and transparent. We recommend adopting vote by mail in New York State for November and indefinitely. Um, NYC needs a robust guide with important dates, deadlines, printed and online. Pre-adjust voter registration forms should be proactively sent to New Yorkers. The CCFB needs to provide a bio platform and website for each candidate. Currently, candidates submit it on their own, so the website was very incomplete. Um, and this should also be extended for state committee district leader candidates, presidential and judicial delegates. There's no way to get that information at the moment. Um, so we were unable to provide that information to people as well. And poll workers should be able to receive robust training on the entire voting process. When I reached out to BOE about that, they pretty much placed blame on poll workers, which I found to be incredibly unfair. Um, and again, this testimony will be provided along with the data from the survey email and thank you so much for letting me testify. Much appreciated. I, I just I just want to thank you for taking the time as you travel uh, to join us in Ukraine uh, to share your testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, next we're going to move to uh, Robin Nelson. Do 
we have Robin. Robin was here, but she seems to have disappeared when I promoted her to a panelist. So if, if she comes back, I will let you know. Okay. Um, until then, we're going to the, the next name on our list, David Marenjo. I think there are two Davids uh, in, 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 in the meeting. Could one of you raise your hand if you're a David Marenjo? Hi, is this on? Uh, All right. I yes, you are. Please, uh, please, um, please proceed. You have two minutes. Please, please Great. remember to tell us where you're, where you're from, where you vote. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is David Marangio. I uh, voted absentee, and I also worked at an early voting polling site and was a site coordinator on election day in Brooklyn. Um, video's coming online now, it seems. My feedback, my feedback is, uh, I'm going to keep that. I hadn't set Zoom up before. So here I guess it's I First time for us too, so. Yep, I know, I know. So hopefully I can do half as good as you guys. Uh, so my feedback is based on observed areas of, uh, for improvement from all three of these experiences. As a voter, I didn't receive the absentee uh, ballot request that was mailed out, but I have something called the uh, USPS Informed Delivery Service. And so I was able to see that the ballot uh, application was mailed to me, but yet somehow didn't physically find its way into my mailbox. So my recommendation uh, is while we're reviewing this process, uh, please look at not only the vendors that were selected to do the mailings, which I understand to be something that uh, someone else had mentioned earlier, but also highly recommend an audit of the performance of the US Postal Service in delivering confirmed mail pieces. And hopefully maybe the informed delivery scans might point our way to seeing exactly how many made it through the mail system. As a poll worker and site coordinator, I thought it would be helpful to have received in advance the information about what measures were being put in place to keep workers and voters safe. As a site coordinator, I know that some workers had already made the decision not to work based on having no information from the board about what working conditions would be like. By the time I was contacting them and sharing the info that was sent only to me, it was too late to change their minds. And so staffing was less than, an, uh, than optimum at my uh, polling sites as well as others. And this leads to higher errors in my experience. The uh, Board of Election training is far from optimal under normal conditions. But this was a missed opportunity this cycle to transition to online training while we were on lockdown. What most people um, may not be aware, in order for someone to work at a poll site, they have to get a refresher training in the position that they're going to be serving. This year, because of the lockdown, fell right as the training period began. After three days of scheduled training, all training ceased and no workers were given refresher training. However, so you're at two minutes. Okay, thanks. However, Thank it's my understanding that any worker who was assigned was trained and certified to work within the past year in the position they were assigned. Um, another point was there was a coordination with the MTA to make use of something called the Essential Connector Program. The problem is the notifications to the to folks who would have needed that service was sent out the day before election day. It would have been far more effective if it was sent out a week before. And since it was automated, there should have been no reason for it. I won't take up everybody else's time. I've got something in writing I'll submit. And thanks very much. Oh, we really appreciate that. Um, and, and thank you for sharing this part of, of this, this story. It's a really, uh, it's a really important, it's a really important part of the story of election day. So uh, we thank you for, for taking the time to share it with us. Absolutely, my pleasure, thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Mac Olivier Lalane. Oh, you still got my camera. Um, this is David. My camera is still left. All <laughs> right. Um, let's get you off of there. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes, please, uh, 
please proceed. All right. So, uh, well, my testimony, well, I was actually in this hearing, like, since last year when I was around my um, ju my uh, sophomore years of, of uh, college. And actually, this is actually my second time testifying, in which my, hello, everyone, my name is Mac Oliver Lillane. I'm actually heading towards my junior year currently for SUNY Plattsburgh. And I am from Brooklyn, New York. Well, for today's t the election today, for this election, I kind of voted temporarily in um, up in Plattsburgh because I was actually helping out with someone when she when he was running for uh, mayor, his mayor, the running for mayor for Plattsburgh. And when, uh, what, during the times when I was in uh, Brooklyn, New York, uh, one thing I would say is that the there was like a lot of issues already that kept thinking of like the poll sites when I was during the time when I was like working for my um my assemblywoman Diana Richardson in which she I remember there was like some talk about like polls like it was moving in last minute just like what, what almost everyone said like how there was like hours of like the MTA and all these like type of issues but the issues I wanted to touch on which was which is in my testimony is that we are in need of like the perspective my overall perspective of the election is I was I was kind of like very hectic due to like the pandemic and all these other other circumstances that we, uh, whew, it was uh, due to the pandemic though whew, sorry due to the pandemic the, everything was like kind of hectic and one thing that I would recommend is that we should have like online voter registration that would make ensure that people are able to register to vote is due to the the hardships of having the on the physical document of the voter registration forms, which we should try like transition to online and also have the forms. And one thing I've also recommended was a comprehensive, comprehensive like procedure protocol for poll sites, so it we would like avoid the issue that happened during this election, in which for the November election is like kind of, we would have we would need these types of um, recommendations that I've have uh, written in I've written in my testimony to ensure that everyone is able to to register to vote and be able to have a higher turnout for this year's election. Thank you very much and I hope everyone have a nice day. Thanks very much, Mac Oliver. Appreciate you taking the time to uh, to share this with us. Yep, no problem. Uh, Next, next up to testify, Anthony Donovan. Need to unmute and start video. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, and I, I really, you guys are very impressive. I'm very touched by the panel before us now. I feel very cared for. So thank you for your work. Um, I am a hospice nurse and uh, just calling as a citizen here. But what we hear much from our top to on the ground is the voting is rigged. So I know this is not your area and perhaps not the topic today, but I really hope us in New York City can do all we can to push back on this. And uh, I, I, in terms of my situation, I did send for an absentee ballot. Um, it did come a day before election day, I chose not to use it. I went to vote in, in my polling place, which uh, is 30 in East Village, um, uh, uh, election district 30 in East Village. I had no problems there. Uh, but when I went to scan my ballot, uh, it scanned very quickly and it seemed like one side, but uh, the, I asked, I said, did that get both sides of that ballot? And she said, oh yeah. I said, well, how do you know? How do I know? She goes, oh, they told us it does. I'm like, okay. So um, I had a friend, I'm a documentarian as well, who did a documentary on Ohio, Ohio's uh, machines and pretty much proved that they were dysfunctional and, uh, and, and infiltrated uh, and that that election was hacked. So to push back on this, I really hope that we can what I'd like to see is an independent team that goes into our, our machines after they're collected and after the day, but checks the information, what, what is given to uh, the official uh, information that is given to our, uh, the results, and to be able to check the paper ballots to those specific machines. I think voter confidence is really critical. I think too many people do not trust machines that we know are made by uh, individual corporations. 
So I think we really have to do something in this area that shows the people that we're on this and we have teams that we can trust. So um, I, I thank you. Uh, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, you, you can't answer that, but I hope we can push for that kind of independent oversight that is verifying with the paper ballots, with the actual results that were sent by a machine from a particular randomly picked, uh, I think would be the way to go. So, you know, rent just a team that can randomly pick uh, polling spots. God bless, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Anthony, really for, for taking the time uh, with us and to share your thoughts. Thank you. Um, next to testify, Daphne Mateo. Can you see me? We can. Okay. Hi. Um, Go ahead. Great. So my name is Daphne Mateo. Um, I'm 30 years old. Just, you know, I wanted demographics in. I'm, East, I'm from East Elmhurst, New York, Queens. And um, I'm, if I'm not mistaken from looking at my voter card, I'm from the Assembly District 34. Um, so the issue that I had with my voting site or my experience in voting was that um, I had to fill via IFA David and I definitely went ahead and switched from no party to Democrat. So when I originally went ahead and I actually, uh, you know, registered to vote when I was um, 18 in 2008, I actually registered to vote via Nightperg and everything went smooth, obviously, but I went ahead and I registered with no party because I just didn't find any affiliation to a party. As I've gotten older, um, obviously I learned a little bit more and I just learned, I'm like, okay, so there's closed, like, you know, primaries, open primaries, et cetera, and so forth. I definitely did vote in 2018. Um, I voted for AOC. So I know for a fact, you know, if I was able to vote in that, I was, I'm definitely in a, a Democrat and I was put in as Democrat. Um, a couple weeks, I would like to say before, I got like a little like bulletin saying that uh, in the mail, you know, just basically reiterating where my polling site, et cetera, and so forth. And it has me as BLK. Now, this is my original one. I'm gonna hide it, but I wanna show you guys. It says BLK. So anytime it's BLK, it means blank. Um, basically, I went ahead and I went to due diligence because I'm like, this probably is a mistake. Let me go ahead and do due diligence. Now, I, and, and go ahead and try to vote anyways. So I went ahead, I attempted to go and vote. Um, at first, when I came up to the first, they, they kind of check you in two times. First time she's like, she could find me, she found me, okay, go to this table, which is Dems and also blank. But then when I went ahead and, uh, or at least according to her, when I went ahead and I went to the table, they had me down as blank. So I had to fill out as affidavit. Now, this is an issue that I have because I've lived in on and off, but I've always voted and I've lived more or less in this area since 2005. Um, as you know, New York or Queens is actually one of the biggest counties and the most like the melting pot basically of the United States, if anything. The and heads up, you're at two minutes. Thank you. Yep. Um, so that being said, if people like, you know, are going to go ahead and see a blank and obviously they know that like, oh, well, I can't go ahead and vote or they're just turned away to go ahead and vote. Sometimes they don't get offered an affidavit. I wasn't offered an affidavit. I just knew that I could go ahead and um, vote via affidavit. Now I was told in the polling site that I'm not the first person that this happened to, that this happened to, to many people in that time. I just wanted to bring it to your attention because it's voter disenfranchising. And I think it's a really big deal, especially when we have a majority, majority of minorities in Queens, New York, and a lot of people that are working class and in poverty. And I think it's a really strong demographic that needs to be heard. So thank you for my time, for your time. <laughs> Thanks very much for, for coming to spend time with us and sharing your thoughts, Daphne. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Um, next, we have Amri Abusin. You got it right. Whew. All right. Thank you again um, to the committee for, can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes. 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 Okay. All right. 
Um, thank you again for the committee for putting this together. Um, I, you know, would like to share my experience and my husband's experience um, within this um, presidential and um, state primary. Recently, um, we are in Manhattan and our voting site was at PS 194. Um, we received a form for um, to, to to file for absentee ballot from our state assembly men, um, L. Taylor, which was great because we didn't have a printer at the time uh, when COVID started. Um, so that was great. However, um, I received my absentee ballot on the day of the election, um, which I, again, like I wasn't planning on it and my husband didn't receive his. Um, that's number one. So we decided to go early to the voting site to vote in person. Um, you know, so we took the precautions as everyone else had mentioned earlier. Um, these are the first two problems that most people have reported. Um, at the voting site, um, I only received one ballot instead of two um, and didn't know about the second one until much later, uh, which made it again, like just um, almost impossible to go back to, um, to get the second one. Um, and this happened to me and my husband and also our neighbor that was also in line um, at the same time that we were there. So I don't know how many other people after us that did not get the second ballot, but um, I figured this is um, an important uh, and and learn uh, like and something that we can learn from for the general election. Um, one of the things that I think uh, would be useful for voters is to know how many ballots that they should be receiving on the day of, so that way they can also check um, in addition to the um, poll um, workers knowing like you know how many to give out. Um, and also the other, the, the final point that I want to make is that like with all the recommendations that you have shared with us earlier, how do we um, keep track of what will be, uh, what, had been, what will be implemented uh, for the general election so that way we know that these uh, measures had been, um, you know, actioned. Thank you again. Thank you, Amri, for coming to share your thoughts and your story. It's much appreciated. Uh, next up. Nora Wong. Hi, this is Nora Wong. Hi. Please go ahead. Thank you for the committee members for uh, the opportunity to, to testify. My name is Nora Wong. My mother, So Wong, is a resident of the Brooklyn's 11th Congressional District of New York. I am speaking on behalf of my mother to share her experience voting in the New York primaries on Tuesday, June 23rd, 2020. My mother arrived at the polling site PS163 in Brooklyn at around 6.30 a.m. She observed approximately five to six voters present at the site with her. My mother entered the station and uh, the voting employee there um, checked her ID and said that um, she didn't have a road, she wasn't registered to vote. Um, after a couple minutes, um, they did identify that she was registered and instructed my mother to proceed to a designated voting booth. There, another voting employee told my mother she was in the wrong place and had to go to another voting site a couple blocks away. After around 15 to 20 minutes of discussion and debate with other employees, that voter, voting employee admitted to um, their mistake that my mother was in the correct polling center, but in the wrong polling booth within the center. Uh, staff directed my mother to the correct polling booth and gave her a ballot to complete. Upon completion, my mother gave the ballot to another voting employee. They told her that the ballot could not be submitted, it couldn't be scanned. After another 20 minutes of discussions, voting employees realized they gave my mother a sample ballot, not an official one. My mother then was given an official ballot and she completed it and it submitted successfully. This experience exposes the inefficiencies and lack of preparation from the voting employees and their staff. Whether intentional or not, these types of inefficiencies, uh, such as mistakenly telling someone to leave the voting site to go to another one, uh, giving someone an invalid ballot cannot can be perceived as voter suppression. These tactics have been used to influence the outcome of an election by discouraging or preventing specific groups of people from voting. My mother's uh, challenge, my mother did challenge the voting staff and was able to successfully submit her ballot. If my mother's experience happened during peak voting hours, delays caused by staff insufficiencies would have had great consequences on election results. 
I hope you'll consider this feedback along with the others to improve the process, training, and preparation for the November 2020 elections. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Nora, for sharing your mother's story and, 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 and for, for her and your advocacy. Um, much appreciated. Um, next, uh, next up, we have Nicole Yearwood. All right, I think you. I think you're still muted, Nicole. Uh, there you are. Better. Let me change my lighting. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm actually also here to testify on behalf of a parent. Um, my name is Nicole Yearwood. I uh, have done work in the past with NYC Votes. I share voting information regularly. I just want to say good evening and thank you uh, to the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee for hosting this event. Uh, regarding the June 23rd primary and for always hosting hearings after each election and listening to our experiences. As someone who shares civic, in, civic education information regularly, I'm really upset about the experience I had trying to have, trying to arrange for an absentee ballot for my recently disabled father. My 85 year old father was disenfranchised by this process and his voting record will now reflect that he missed an election. Missing an election can lead to being purged from the rolls and will change his super prime voter status. After a week of receiving campaign calls from candidates, political parties, and elected officials, and more than 20 mailers from candidates, he was unable to do his civic duty. My father lives in the 15th congressional district where there was a hotly contested race. I applied on his behalf for the absentee ballot online. On Friday, June 19th, I, re I realized he had not received his absentee ballot. On Saturday, June 20th, first thing in the morning, before that primary, I called the Bronx County Board of Elections, spoke with someone and was told uh, that they would overnight an absentee ballot to him after I explained his situation, his inability to walk and, um, and just get to physically get to a poll site. They said they would overnight the ballot. Monday, June 22nd, no ballot arrived. Tuesday, the day of the primary, I called the Board of Elections again, was directed to the same person, left a message. Of course, I didn't hear anything and I didn't expect to because it was election day. All day Tuesday, I waited for the mail to arrive at my father's home. I waited until 7.30, risking my own participation and doing my own civic duty. No mail carrier arrived. So of course I had to leave at 7.30 to go cast my ballot in Manhattan. To date, he has not received one absentee ballot. We were told that his absentee ballot was mailed on June 15th, and then there was one that was supposed to come overnight. There's still no ballot received to his address. Thank you so much for listening and that concludes my testimony at this time. Um, thank you, Nicole, for, for speaking up for your father, for your, your advocacy and, and for your partnership. It's much appreciated. Thank you for, for your testimony. You're welcome. Uh, next, uh, next to testify, Theo Chino. Can you, hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Hi. Hi. My name is Theo Chino. How are you? Uh, I am a, I am a found, the co-founder of Rep My Blog, a website that is an open source system to promote people to run for office, whatever the office they feel like running. And I'm a member of the Democratic Party County Committee, second election district in Harlem in the 71st AD. And I just wanted to echo what has been said. I mean, I'm not going to repeat. Uh, Philip just said that the system is rigged. And I was curious on David's experience that just spoke a little bit earlier. Uh, first of all, voters don't know about these meetings, these kind of meetings. So I wanted to figure out how we can make it uh, more 
that people hear more about it. But I also want to recognize the BOE works because they handle a lot of candidates. Election is about voting for candidates. So if you have 10 candidates that propose the same item, basically you're not voting for anything but the item or the single voice, whether it's represented by one voice, one candidate, or 15 candidates. We need different opinions and different candidates running on different issues. And that is the problem with the system. You can change everything you want until we hear different voices and different voices have the ability to speak, nothing will change. So one thing I wanted to bring up is equal time. The system is rigged because the TV decides on whose voice shall be heard. A new candidate does not have a voice until he shows up on TV for some reason. And the local broadcast media, MNN, Bronx 12, all those clear channels, whether in the 1980s there were one channel out of 30, when a uh, channel surfer would serve, there would be 30 chance of running into that channel. So when there would be a debate organized by them, there would be one of 30 chance. Today is one channel as of 1,000. That means the regular voter will never hear a different voice than what Errol Lewis puts out in the media. Until you show up on Errol Lewis, you don't show up as a candidate and the voter will have no choice. The second thing is the education for the parties in politics. I think it would be important for you guys to explain what is parties in politics. What position, what is a district leader, what is a county committee, what is all those positions that nobody heard of, they need to be educated. The other thing is also to institute a cognitive and dexterity test to the poll worker. Because poll workers are there because the district leader have some way they're handing to the pot. So you know, just a heads up, you're at two minutes. Okay, I'll finish up very quickly. Thank everybody you. knows the trick, district leader put challenge, cognitive put challenge people in poll center where they know it would be best to have a mess. And they put good people who are cognitive in people where they get things like that. So that's basically the end of my testimony. But thank you very much. Uh, continue good work. <laughs> we'll get there. Thank you, Theo. And thank you for, for your testimony. Uh, next, we are going to hear from Mike Howard. Hello, can, you, can anyone hear me? Yes. Yep. We're here. Yes. Please go ahead. Let us know where you're from and please begin your testimony. Okay. Um, my name is Michael J. Howard. You can call me Mike. Um, I, I reside in Far Rockaway, Queens, um, Assembly District 23, um, State Senate District 15, and Congressional Congressional District Five, and um, I just um asked the I just asked the question through the Q and A to to make sure is to make sure is there any evidence that people with disabilities like myself, even though I have a um mild intellectual disability, I just want to make sure that I just want to make sure that my vote counts. I'm not, I mean, I'm not speaking for anybody else, but I'm just speaking for my, I'm just advocating for myself. And, and also I'm a self-advocate and a blacktivist and abolish, abolish, abolitionist. Um, so anyway, um, I agree on a couple of people saying that it was, I mean, it was corporations who put these machines, who put these machines to suppress people's votes in the minority. You know what I mean? And corporations paying politicians for them to do it and to make politicians as puppets on both sides, not just one side, both sides. Because I noticed for the fact that Democrats be be suppressing the um, primary votes 
every time any of us vote somebody newer to put somebody newer in office. And Republicans, on the other hand, they rig they rig on um, the general election. Mike, thanks for your testimony. You're at two minutes. If you want to wrap up. Well, anyway, um, what I'm saying is, I don't know why. I don't know why some of some of them get to stay in office for something they did. They did something they did, and they need to confess. Because if they don't confess, they really need to. They really need to get out. And definitely. Thank you, Mike. Anytime. Thanks for your testimony. And thanks for sharing your story. Um, next, we're going to hear from Becca Lish. Yeah, you would think we'd all have figured it out by now. All right, well, we, we, you're here. We got you. Please, uh, please sorry. let us know where you're from and go ahead. My name is Rebecca Lish. I am a voter in the Bronx in the 81st Assembly District. Rebecca, excuse yeah. me, could you turn up the volume a little bit? It's very hard to hear you. Oh, boy. Okay, how's that? Better? Thank you. Great. So my name, let me get this out of the way. My name is Rebecca Lish. I'm a voter in the Bronx in the 81st Assembly District, living in the affluent 81st Election District within the borough of the Bronx, where many of the residents are black and brown New Yorkers living in poverty. I vote in the 16th Congressional District, which spans two cities in two counties with very disparate populations whose ability to exercise the franchise is impacted differently by radical differences in economic status. I'd like to share my experience of absentee and early voting, but mindful of the limited value of anecdotal evidence, I wanna stress that I'm providing this testimony as an example of how the problems in these processes were managed by a person of privilege in an affluent election district. My overarching concern is that the barriers I faced could impact other Bronx sites very differently. I'm one of four voters registered in my home who all filed applications online on the first possible date within seconds of one another. My ballot arrived timely, and since the others had not arrived a week later, I began to call the Bronx Board of Elections to ask about their status. It took several days and voicemails to reach a human being at the BOE. I had marked my ballot, but I didn't mail it back, which turned out to be a stroke of luck, as it turned out I had misunderstood the delegate system, and one congressional candidate dropped out of the race. So by the time I succeeded in reaching that person at the BOE, my agenda had expanded to include securing a replacement ballot for myself. The person reached on June 8th resisted, but eventually did check um, and informed me that my husband's ballot had been mailed on May 29th and our two kids' ballots had been mailed on June 2nd. As postal service in the Bronx is spotty under normal circumstances and nearly non-existent since New York went on pause, uh, I figured we'd need to keep waiting. My replacement ballot arrived by early the following week, within a few days. However, it did arrive as two separate ballots in two separate envelopes, each containing a return envelope that was marked place postage here and would have required a stamp to return. By June 13th, the other three ballots still had not arrived. My husband and I decided, despite being members of a higher risk group, to vote in person early at our nearby convenient polling place. On the 21st of June, their ballots still not having arrived, our two children also voted in person at the early polling place where the guards were wearing their masks beneath their chins. Becca, I just wanna let you know that you're at time if you could wrap up, okay. thank you. It is now July 1st and the ballots that were mailed on May 29th and June 2nd still have not arrived and the USPS informed delivery doesn't show them as on their way. Mail service is unreliable in our borough, but I imagine it may be more reliable in Westchester. So if those disparities exist, they may well fall along lines of privilege and amplify the votes of those whose voices are already amplified in innumerable ways. So my concern is that these difficulties may have disproportionately disadvantaged those who are already at a disadvantage, whose participation in the franchise is critical. And additionally, conspiracy theories about non-receipt of ballots are proliferating. Mistrust of the results has already taken hold 
among some who are displeased with the early results. If voters come to believe they can't trust our systems, the resulting lack of faith in our government will be deeply corrosive, especially among those who are already marginalized, whose skepticism may be well warranted. Thank you. Thanks very much, Becca, for, for taking the time to, to tell your story. Um, we, we're we're going to get through the last few names on our list. Uh, I just want to note for folks, um, if you want to keep in touch with NYC Votes beyond the end of this hearing, um, we're posting a few, a few ways to do that in the chat. Um, so make sure you take a look there, um, whether you prefer to get text or, 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 or join us on, on social media platforms. We'll have information for, for you in the chat on how best to do that. Um, uh, moving ahead, uh, next up, we have Wilson R. Hello. Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Wilson uh, and I worked as in a variety of roles uh, during the early voting period and on election day. Um, I noticed uh, a recurring uh, issue at a variety of sites, um, a lack of masks either being worn incorrectly or just not at all by both staff and police officers, uh, most egregiously up at PS7 uh, in Manhattan. And I feel like with so many voters uh, that may be immunosuppressed that this can amount to disenfranchisement. Uh, and when it comes to a failure to wear masks, I feel that there should be zero tolerance. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, that was really the, the main concern that I've had. Uh, everyone else seemed to piggyback uh, on, on and emphasize the, uh, the absentee ballot issue, so I won't waste any more of your time, but thank you for having me. Wilson, thanks for, for sticking with us and for sharing, uh, sharing your testimony. It's much appreciated. All right. Um, next up, we have uh, Laura muller Sapart. Hi. Hi. Great. Uh, my name is Laura Sopart, um, and I'm a resident of Clinton Hill. Um, so like many, I requested my absentee ballot by the mail in May, and it never came. Um, and upon learning that I had to be in Chicago, I was told to reapply online. And I did so before the deadline. And unfortunately, my ballot also did not arrive. So I could not vote in person either. Um, Honestly, just like echoing Amani's statement from earlier, it's just really scary that we're even talking about how to do enough. Um, you know, we talk a lot about how to do it better, but the baseline has to be that voters can vote. And if the basics of democracy are at play, then I think we kind of need to talk about that, like for what it is. Um, super encouraged by like hearing all the efforts that are being put forward um, and and legislation is acknowledged, advocacy is acknowledged, um, but also I think it was like David and Nora's testimony about the actual poll working and like the physical reality of voting. Um, I just wanted to hear more about acknowledging um, the poll worker training um, logistics and how that's going to be addressed and how, what, we, what can we do to help you right, of if under-resourcing is always the issue that comes in, that is like the answer, then I think that the public can do a lot more to advocate um, to make sure that under-resourcing is less of an issue. Um, and so at the end of the day, it's just illogical. Cutting polling locations in the face of COVID um, means that we can't do social distancing. Poll workers are on average over 60 years old we're available and we're down to be poll workers, but like, how do we get engaged? How do we get more people to be co um, to be poll workers? And how can we make sure that that process is, is good and plenty? Um, and my second point that I'd like to ask is, and how is our testimony going to be presented to the stakeholders that can implement the changes for November? Um, it's great that NYC votes host these public hearings preemptively, um, but then what happens after the fact? Uh, there's this like special window between now and November where there's time, but it's enough that we like still feel the urgency and how, how are you guys going to capture that 
and, and represent our, our voice to those stakeholders. Um, you know, just act. Is there press at this testimony? It would be great to read more about this, not just once after the election, but from now until November. So like I'm here because I want to help. Um, and so just to hear more about how we can get in engaged and amplify poll working and all the other issues that were talked about, um, it'd be great. And, and honestly, at the end of the day, really encouraged. Thank you for hosting this and for the time. Laura, thank you for your testimony. I'll just, one of your questions has an easy answer. Uh, we just posted the link to, to, to information about being a poll worker in the chat. Um, so you can go to the Board of Elections website and, and there will be information about, um, about. Uh, I'm registered. I just know that there's so many more people like me that would be down to help, right? For and certain. So you know, how do we reach out to them? Yeah. Yeah, for, for sure, for sure. Um, and, and they do publicity to recruit poll workers every year around election time. Um, and, and we, to the extent we can amplify that, we do. Um, to your second question, I, I think there's, I mean, that, that is a question for all of us to, to, to talk about and, and take what we've heard today and, and make sure we're reflecting it out to the people who can make a difference, to the Board of Elections, to the legislators whose help we need to change election law, um, to um, to make sure that we can run a November election that uh, is run smoothly and, and, and enables every voter who wants to cast a ballot safely to do it. Um, so I, there is there is no um, single answer to that question, but we're going to be we're going to be working at it um, starting tomorrow. So many thanks for your testimony. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to hear from Tedra Milan. Hi there. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Please, okay, please go ahead and listen, let us know where you're from and, Thank and you. get, get started. Thank you so much. Thanks for allowing me to testify. My name is Tedra Milan and I um, am from Brooklyn. I've also submitted a written testimonial. Um, I'm unaffiliated with an organization. I'm just a concerned voter. Um, so I applied for an absentee ballot that never arrived. Um, and I ended up going to the polls the next morning at, uh, I mean, not the next morning. I went to the polls, um, on voting day at 630 in the morning. And when I arrived, one of the two scanners had already been broken. Um, and when I approached my table, I was told that I was at the wrong polling place, even though I double and triple checked that I was at the correct one and I'd previously voted there. Um, and then I was asked to fill out an affidavit and the same thing happened to the man that was directly behind me. Um, so then I received my affidavit and when I went into the booth, I noticed that I'd only received one page of the ballot and the presidential and the delegate ballot was missing. And I asked the volunteers if I could get the extra page and no one seemed to know anything about another page. Um, and then eventually the volunteer did find an extra page of not that, but um, of a page with just two candidates that I'd never heard of in a category that I didn't know anything about. So I finally um, went to go hand it in and then a volunteer said, you can wait for the volunteer to come back, but in the meantime, you can just lick your ballot closed. And I was wearing two masks and I was not going to lick an envelope, but luckily it was just a sticky strip. Um, and then finally I got home and I was deeply unsatisfied that I hadn't been able to vote for the president and the delegates. So I called a hotline and they said, um, I, I, I actually received a, a USPS alert that my ballot would arrive that day. So I called a hotline and I asked if I could um, vote with this absentee ballot if it arrived in time. And they said yes to email someone. And if it doesn't arrive to go to the Board of Elections. So my ballot did not arrive in time. Um, it actually ended up arriving at the very end of my day. But I did go to the Board of Elections. Uh, to get an absentee ballot. I was told I could fill it out there and then return it there. Um, but I got there and they said that it was too late and that I needed to plead my case to the judge. So I ended up having to go down this hallway where there were a lot of people walking around without masks. And I was um, eventually ushered into a room with a cop and a woman who were thankfully wearing masks and um, a laptop that was open on a Zoom call to two virtual judges. And I pled my case to the two judges and explained that I never was able to vote for the president and delegates. And they finally agreed that I could um, get a new ballot, override my previous vote. And so um, I signed something and then I was led back into initial, the initial main office. And I had to wait for 30 minutes, which was pretty uncomfortable considering a lot of people were walking around without masks. And you know, I wanted to just get in and out and I'd already gone beyond my 
general comfort zone. Um, but eventually after 30 minutes, I did receive this ballot um, and a woman led me into another room and I was able to vote completely. And then when she, when I gave it back in, she said, there's, uh, we're not, we don't have any more glue, but we do have tape. Um, so you can, you can tape up your ballot and give it back to me. Um, so just, um, I'm, you know, pretty concerned about the general, um, why so many people aren't showing up as, as being registered at their place to vote and um, general organization, the absentee ballots, um, but also just to make sure that in the November general election that there is a sticky tape on all of these envelopes if, they're, if people do need to submit via affidavit. So yeah, um, thank you so much for this public hearing. It's been very illuminating, so thank you so much. Pedro, th thank, thank you. you. I'm, I'm very impressed with what people have, you know, been able to, you know, put themselves through it in order to vote. So uh, incredibly impressive, you know. I've never done anything like this before. It was the first time, but um, yeah, I just want to make my vote count. It's the least we can do. So thanks for being here. Thank you for your commitment. <laughs> thanks. Thank you for your story. Uh, thanks for spending time with us this evening. Thank you. Um, so we are we are right now about to get to the last name on our list. Um, I will. Uh, just put out a last call. If, if there are folks who have been with us for waiting patiently for this hearing um, and, and have not uh, put your name forward to speak, please let us know. Uh, put your name in the chat and we'll, 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 we will call on you. Uh, the, the last name that I have to call on is Juliana, for the moment, Juliana Pesavento. Hi. I think, I think, yep. I've unmuted myself. Unmuted. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for organizing this this evening. Um, my name is Juliana and I'm a resident of Brooklyn Heights. Um, and I actually served as a poll worker doing, during the June 23rd election for the first time. So my testimony is related to that experience. Um, I worked at 225 Atlantic Avenue and took the day off of my primary job to work the polls. Um, I took a poll working class several months ago and received my assignment about a week in advance of the election. Um, my experience was a scary, shocking inside look at our poll working system. Um, and I really think that we can register as many people to vote as possible, but if the actual poll system fails, there is truly no point. Um, so for those who don't know, a coordinator is supposed to be assigned to each polling place and is supposed to be the person in charge. Um, on the day of the election, the rest of the regular workers and myself all were there on time by 5.30 in the morning. Our coordinator showed up at 7 a.m., which is an hour after polling was supposed to begin. Um, I have a host of comments about her performance specifically, but I won't turn this into a personal attack. Um, what I would like to make very clear is the lack of education and preparation that the Board of Elections is taking to ensure a smooth and fair voting experience is completely unacceptable. Um, as a poll worker, I received no communication about what to do with people that were handing in absentee ballots to our polling place um, and an overview of the ballots in general or safety precautions that we as poll workers were supposed to be taking to ensure the safety of ourselves and the voters in the midst of this global health pandemic. Throughout my time working the scanner station, I was constantly sending voters back to the tables at which they received their ballots because they had received only one, sometimes three, and sometimes two of the same ballots. Um, on the subject of safety precautions, the morning after the election, I read an article in Time Out New York detailing safety precautions that were supposed to be taken at the polls, inclusive of distancing, sanitizing, and more. My station did not one of these things. Um, I have shared this information directly with the Board of Elections, uh, requested a response, and have not heard back. So I want to call for a massive report, reform of our poll working process so that every voter has the right to do so in New York City. Thank you so much. Juliana, thank you for stepping up to, to work the polls and, and thank you for sharing that story. Um, it's, it's a really important one for everyone to hear and, and um, I thank you for taking the time uh, to be here with us. Thanks again. Um, so we've reached the end of, of, of our public testimony. I wanna you know, turn back to the committee just to see before we, uh, before we conclude the hearing, um, if folks have have thoughts they want to share uh, at this at this time, um, I guess what all I will say is, 
you know, our office, the Office of the Public Advocate, we received several of these reports. And just to hear everyone reiterate um, and even add more context from the poll workers' perspective is just sobering. Um, you know, our office is looking into it. Um, we're taking a number of steps to um, follow up regarding the election. And um, this is just all very unfortunate. And I know that the pandemic has a lot to do with it, but, you know, it just, it just further shows us why we need like fail safes in our system, um, because this is maybe the first time we've gone through a pandemic like this, but it doesn't mean that we won't go through other emergencies, maybe hurricanes, maybe other types of crisis. So, um, yeah. Happy to work with all of you on this moving forward. Well, on, on behalf of the campaign finance board, I want to thank everyone who testified. I mean, it's really impressive that you shared your stories. I want to thank our staff for their incredibly wonderful presentations, always clear and detailed uh, data oriented presentations about what the problems are. Um, and again, I just, you know, it, it, you know, while a lot of these pro problems are issues that are related to the pandemic and specific to the, you know, the increased number of absentee voters. Some of these are problems that we have heard over and over again as we've had these hearings over the years. And we will be again advocating for changes to make sure that the election, you know, people aren't disenfranchised and that the uh, process as smooth as possible for everyone who goes to vote and to exercise their franchise and not feel disenfranchised by the system. Um, and I see that some person, one of our attendees recommended that we mention, and I think it's a good idea that, you know, if people haven't uh, filled out their census form, please do that. It's incredibly important to the whole government process that are that New Yorkers are counted in the appropriate numbers that we get our just rep representation in the Congress and in federal funding for all different kinds of programs. So if you haven't filled out your census form, please do so. Eric, you wanna wind us up? Well, I see, I see Danielle has her hand raised. I know me was, was unmuted for a second. If you guys have thoughts, please, uh, please jump in. I just want to say that one of the, uh, one of the members of the public asked us, what are we going to do with this information? And I just want to say to all of the members of the public who are still on that we hear you, that you have so accurately and in great detail described huge failures of management and implementation. And we will certainly be passing all of this along uh, in excruciating detail with personal anecdotes uh, to the people who uh, we uh, look to to actually do something about this. So thank you again for hanging in there and for all your, for all your work. I just wanted to say, um, I have the deepest admiration for all of you who testified. And after this hearing last year, I was so impressed and so motivated. I actually decided to sign up as a poll worker and I went through the training and um, I, I wanted to have my own story to tell at this hearing, <laughs> but I could not, I, bring myself to do the 15 hour shift. And I mean, I'm working two jobs right now, filling it for my boss. And I, I just, that remains like the biggest deterrent, I think, you know, that, I, yeah. So my hat's off to you again. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I'll, I'll echo that. And before, before we close, I want to give one last pitch for everyone. Um, please help us amplify all these stories we've heard tonight. Please, um, you know, if you are not already connected with us, um, if you haven't signed up to receive emails and alerts from us um, or, or, or joined us on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, the information is there in the chat. Please do it. Please share these stories with, uh, with your friends and your networks. Um, get your friends and your and your relatives and your neighbors um, and people you meet on the street. Get them involved um, and and help help us spread this story and, and light a fire under people. Um, I'll, I'll I'll end kind of where I started with a reminder that the general election is in four months. Um, we've got some work to do.
So um, if anyone else has anything to add, um, please do. With a few extra seconds of silence, I will say I will once again thank everybody um, for spending time with us tonight. And, um, and to the extent that I can propose that we close the hearing. Thank you. So yes, I think thank, thank you everyone for participating and, um, and we will uh, be getting information out to the slides um, and uh, information about the hearing to uh, people who signed up. Yes, video and transcripts and everybody's written testimony will be available um, on our website and we'll make sure those links are available to everyone. Good night all. Good night.